Okay, good morning, folks. If we could all get seated, uh, apologies for the slight delay. We, we the change in uh, venue, sorry, the change in date has meant that you know our coffee is now, I think, three floors up, so on the second floor, our coffee break will be there, and our uh, lunch and networking will also be there. So, um, welcome to uh, day two. So, if you did see me yesterday, my name is Roger Sutton. I'm one of the champions of the UK Climate Resilience Programme at the University of Leeds. And it's uh, yeah, great to see so many faces here today for uh, the second day of the conference. So yesterday we had a, a jam-packed day of research advancements uh, in the field, both in characterizing climate risk, managing uh, climate risk, and also in the sort of emerging field of, of climate services. And today, you know, we only have half a day. We're, we're going to focus very much on what the policy and practice implications. Sorry. Okay. Is that better? Is that better at the back, Nick? Yeah. Okay. Thumbs up. Brilliant. Um, so, um, as I was saying, yeah, today we're going to focus on the policy and practice implications. Uh, and in terms of the, the formats, just to give you, I mean, a little bit like yesterday, uh, here's, the, here's the Wi-Fi code. You can see it on the, on the, on the walls as well. Uh, there's the QR uh, code. So do put in your questions for our, our keynotes and also for the, the panel sessions. Uh, please uh, use that uh, and we'll, we'll put that up again a, a little bit later. Let's see if this works. Okay, here we go. Um, so uh, we're very fortunate that uh, Svenja Smirsky, from uh, a, a member of the Committee on Climate Change, has uh, agreed at short notice to join us. Thank you, Svenja, very much to, to give us perspectives from the Committee on Climate Change. As, as you can see afterwards, we're going to move into panel discussions. So we're, you know, we're, we're going to have a, an inspirational talk from uh, some colleagues that have uh, been commissioned to write inside papers. So uh, we, we asked a variety of colleagues across the program to try to synthesize the research. Hopefully you got the impression yesterday that, you know, we've done a lot and it's very diverse. So the aim of these inside papers were really to synthesize uh, what's been learned across all those kind of three main areas. And so a few colleagues uh, are going to introduce a couple of inside papers in these panel discussions. Uh, and then afterwards, we've invited colleagues from uh, government, uh, consultancies, practice, uh, to tell us their views uh, on this. So we're going to start with climate hazard and risk assessment. And then after the coffee break, we're going to talk about adaptation uh, and climate services. Uh, and then we'll wrap up and we'll have some time to, to, to network uh, at, uh, you know, over lunch as well. So. Uh, Thanks very much. Well, welcome also to the people who are in the live stream. I, I tend to forget that there's, there's the, the, yesterday there were more people in the live stream than physically there, and possibly the snow may, may, may have discouraged someone to, to attend. So welcome as well. So it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Jim Hall. Uh, Jim has played a, a really big role in the program. He's chaired the steering committee uh, since the beginning of the program. And Jim has also been a member, actually, of the Committee on Climate Change. Uh, in the past, and currently he's uh, a, a, a member of the National Infrastructure Commission. So, Jim, I'll hand over to you to uh, chair this session and introduce Svenja. So, if everyone can speak to the mic. Great. Good morning, everyone, and thank you very much indeed, uh, Suraj, for that uh, introduction. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here, and on this occasion of the uh, the, the final conference of this program, which um, a whole bunch of people in the room have invested a great deal of effort in and, and made a great deal of progress on, I think. Um, I should, I, uh, as Sir Roger said, amongst other things, I've been um, chair of the um, steering committee and the scientific committee for this program. Um, and on behalf of that committee, I should say um, a great deal of thanks to our champions team um, who've been driving this 
program forwards, um, in particular to um, Saraj, Kate and Jason, um, who've, who've done a fantastic job in um, pulling things together, creating a genuinely um, integrated program from an incredible diversity of, of different things going on. Um, and I'll come back to that kind of point around the, the breadth and diversity of adaptation versus the need for focus um, in a moment. Um, I should also thank um, members of the uh, of the steering group as well, um, who've uh, invested quite a bit of time behind the scenes in terms of um, advising on and keeping the program on track. Um, we were involved in um, the uh, program design, possibly a bit late in the day, in the sense that the first tranche of funding had already been um, agreed upon before the uh, the scientific committee was actually up and running. I think there's a lesson for any funders out there in terms of um, doing things in a timely way. Um, haste is inefficient when it comes to, to research um, and uh, long-term commitment um, is much more efficient. Um, but the committee was then um, involved in, in design of the, the large part of the program. Um, we've uh, monitored it and provided feedback as it's gone along um, and including in reporting more formally to uh, to the UKRI um, function of this um, uh, strategic um, priority um, and also have, have been put it into some of the, the integration with other things going on. For example, the, the CS Now program, um, which you'll have heard about and we'll hear more about today um, and the uh, the uh, the um, CARIB um, Research and Innovation Board, which is uh, is taking much of this forward in the, in the context of government. So um, I think what this program has really illustrated to me is this point around the, the, the breadth of adaptation research. There's been incredible diversity, um, almost overwhelming, in fact. And I think that illustrates just how many dimensions of our national and global existence um, adaptation kind of features and factors into. Um, and the program I kind of see as being a bit of a kaleidoscope of that, of just lots of different facets of, of, of a very kind of complex process, which is adaptation now. Um, but within that, um, I think it is really important to, to, to get a strong sense of priority. Um, within the last climate change risk assessment, we had 61 risks. Um, uh, I often think that the CCRA2 was much clearer in that sense around floods, droughts, extreme heat, sea level rise and coastal change. A very short list which people can really get their heads around in terms of what are the big climate risks out there. Um, but what this program has also, I think, done is, is, is built... Um, some cross-cutting capability and given that kind of complexity and multi-dimensional aspect of, of adaptation, what really matters is building multi-purpose capabilities that can be used in, in a whole variety of different contexts. And then embedding that, um, mainstreaming if you like, um, within the processes that already exist across different um, sectors, different infrastructures and so on. And I often use what's um, been going on in, in the water sector for a long time is that it, it would just be unthinkable to do a water resource management plan without trying to access the best climate science um, in terms of what's going to happen with water availability in the future. And uh, in a sense, the, the, the climate there has become absolutely central to the water companies and the regulators business and that's um i think that the direction of travel supported by this cross-cutting capability of of data modeling but also processes and frameworks so frameworks for how we make adaptation decisions what's good practice which we can pick up across a whole range of different sectors so those are just a, a few takeaways which siraj had invited me to to, to reflect on um, as we come to the end of this program, but also look forwards um, to, um, to research going forwards. 
Um, and at this point, it's a great pleasure to hand over to Swonia Sominski and, and introduce Swonia, um, who, as we've heard, is a member of the Adaptation Committee of the Committee on Climate Change. Um, she's also Managing Director for Climate and Sustainability at Marsh McClellan um, and is Professor of Practice in the Grantham Institute at LSE. So um, uh, incredibly well qualified to start us off, Swenya, um, thinking on today's theme of the implications of this research for policy and practice. We'll have an opportunity for some questions afterwards, including from the Slido. Um, so please start um, either putting your questions in the Slido um, or be ready to put your hand up in a kind of more traditional physical way. Um, Swenya, over to you. Thank you, Jim, and thank you, Suraj. It's a great pleasure to be here. Before I start, I notice we're 20 minutes behind schedule. So do you want to, me to speak very fast? Or... <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Um, excellent, I think it was worth checking because what I actually really think is, is important is to have discussion. So, you know, I, once I get, get going, you know, in this topic, it's quite easy to get carried away, but I would be really keen to, to also have time for, for discussion. Um, huh. Okay, well, I'm actually giving you, uh, you know, three in one presentation here. I, I sort of have different roles and I'll give you a flavor from a sort of policy perspective, also research and practice. And I think that is actually really fitting because isn't this what, what this whole event is all about? To take research findings and then apply them in policy and practice. And I guess, you know, a big, big compliment also from, from my end for what the program has been doing. I mean, it's been amazing. Unfortunately, I wasn't here yesterday to see and listen to, to the presentations, but, you know, I, I know all the good stuff that's been coming out of this. So in a way, it's a bit sad. I think final conference always sounds sad, but, um, you know, I think it's, it's a step and then obviously there, there will need to be a lot of more work. And I think that's one of the messages um, that I also wanted to pass on. So anyway, I'll give you, that's number one in my three for one. I'll give you a little bit, very briefly, a reflection on the research side, and then you get some reflections on the practice side. And the for, fortunate, and maybe the main message is, they are all very well aligned. And I think that's actually a really powerful message. So what we're seeing now coming out of research is starting to influence policy and we're using it in the CCC to inform um, the work that we're doing now with government. And it's also been taking account of the private sector. And I think that's actually quite probably different to where we were maybe even five years ago on, on this topic. So here are some key messages and I think that's you know, that's probably all I want you to take away. And, you know, I could stop my presentation at this point, um, which might be cheating because I said I would give you a three, three for one. So I'll, I'll explain a little bit of what's behind this and how I'm coming up with these, these sort of um, recommendations. I mean, none of them should be really a big surprise, but I think it's important to just sort of um, see where we are and where we need to go. And I think, you know, it's fair to say, you know, we have a really strong um, community on adaptation within in the UK and that's underpinned with excellent research. You know, we have the adaptation committee that works very closely with government. And then we also have quite a lot happening in the private sector. So in a way, it's, it's the ideal setup the question is, are we utilizing it as well as we can? And is this actually enough to respond to the challenges ahead? And yeah, if you look at these sort of key messages, and I'll come back to them at the end, um, I think we are, you know, in a good position, but much more needs to be done. Okay. Okay. Is this better? Okay, I'll do my best. So I'll just give you a little bit of, of background and flavor, and then I'm, I'm come back to, to these. So um, last year, I was appointed to the uh, Committee on Climate Change and the Adaptation Committee. And I guess this audience is hopefully familiar with what we do and the role that we have in terms of, you know, the UK Climate Change Risk Assessment and the National Adaptation Program. Um, and in fact, 
later this month, we're going to publish the progress report. Every two years, there's an adaptation progress report. And we're currently busy reviewing the draft. And I know Richard Miller is here and he will be sitting on a panel uh, later on. And I think it's a really important part of, you know, sort of checking policies and checking implementation and progress and commenting on where the gaps are. And as we all know, you know, measuring progress on adaptation, well, that's that's a big challenge. And, you know, there's no ideal way, there's no clear metric. But, you know, we have a good framework. And I think this is actually a really important part in this whole process. And then UK climate change risk assessment. I'm sure many of you were already involved in the previous three rounds. The next one is coming. So, um, you know, be, be brace yourself. There will be requests for inputting it. But again, it's a good example of actually having that engagement with, with science, with research. And also, and that's my role on the committee, also with the private sector. I'm really keen to bring in more of the expertise that we have in the private sector on climate risk. So that's the sort of setup. The urgency of adaptation has increased. Um, you know, this is also the reflection. Jim mentioned the CCRA and the, the sort of changes in terms of numbers of risk. But I think that the key message is also the, the change there in terms of urgency and, you know, more action needed. And that's basically a call to action. Um, I mentioned the assessing progress of adaptation policy. And I think what, what we find really useful is to build this around principles um, you know, what is actually effective adaptation? You know, how should it look like? How should it be implemented? And then take that as, as guidance. And you, if you look at these, um, you know, a lot of these findings come from the analysis that we've been doing with CCRA 3, for example, assess interdependencies. I mean, that's a massive issue for adaptation, you know, not just looking at one part of the system, but how the system works. Avoid lock-ins address inequalities, consider opportunities. So I think this is more or less a guidance of when you do adaptation, consider these. Have you done these? Have you looked at these? And I think that's, that's actually quite, quite a useful sort of framework to look at it. Um, but, and I'll just put this out here, you know, we, we can give good guidance. Um, we can also comment on progress, but at the end of the day, you know, it's, it's also a question of how much that's actually then taken into account. And, um, well, w watch the space, read the next adaptation progress report, um, because, you know, unfortunately, there are significant gaps and, you know, there needs to be more action. There are also opportunities coming up in terms of policy making where adaptation can be factored in into sort of in strategies that focus on, on different parts of the economy, different parts of the um, you know, of the po political agenda where adaptation wasn't really part of it. So I think that's another question of some mainstreaming adaptation to this. But um, yeah, um, our recommendations are not there to be read, but also to, to be taken into account. And just briefly, I don't want to go into detail, but draw to your attention that um, earlier, I think it was last month in February, we published the first report on adaptation investment and financing for adaptation. So I hope some of you have seen it. It's a really useful summary of where we are, but also what, what the um, challenges are and the barriers are. And here are some, some recommendations. Again, I'm not going to go into real detail, but it sort of highlights that this is no longer a question of do we understand the risk, but what are we going to do about it? And, and do the right players have the information and integrate that into their decisions? Um, and yeah, this, the, the size of the investment flows. I mean, I have this conversation a lot in the private sector where people ask me, what is actually the scale, the financial scale of adaptation and how big is the financial need when it comes to adaptation? And, you know, I had a conversation last week with an investment bank and they said, Svenja, is this the next wave of climate finance? And I said, well, the next wave, I, you know, we shouldn't really look at this in different ways, because, waves because obviously mitigation finance is massively important. But I think there's a sense that we are at the cusp of seeing sort of a shift that more money will be flowing into adaptation, also driven purely by the fact that, you know, we, the, the impacts are getting more real and, and we see them and we experience them. 
Um, so just very briefly in terms of highlighting this interplay with research and then the sort of policy side. And lock-in is a good example. Um, so my team at LSE, we, we worked on this, trying to understand how decisions that we're making today are putting us onto wrong pathways. And, and, you know, this was a big theme that came out of CCRA 3, and I think it will also feature in CCRA 4, because it's this notion, we can talk a lot about investing in adaptation, we can talk a lot about the, you know, the need to change policies, but ultimately, if we do not address the current, you know, sort of lock-in decisions that are being made, and that's about, you know, where we build, how we build, basically today, um, that that's really important, and I think research can can play a huge part in highlighting how these actually these decisions put us on the wrong um, pathways. And then the other part of of research that actually prompted me also to take up my my new role in the private sector is this notion that if you if you really want to deliver adaptation, you know it it needs to be a way of of bringing together different you know, different stakeholders. I mean, that sounds like so obvious, but it isn't. Um, and I, I, I kind of get often shake my head when I see these reference, we need better public-private partnerships and collaborations. We've been saying this for, for a long, long time. I think the question is how we actually bring these together and make this work. And I think there are some really good examples, but still often it's this kind of, silo thinking and there's also a lack of, of communication or translation between different sectors again that was also driving my my decision to to go back into the private sector and work there but here you you can just see the myriad of actors that actually have an influence on on how risk actually turn out and and you know this is the case of you know basically planning and then delivering homes but you know you can play this in terms of infrastructure in terms of other risks um, and then stakeholder needs. And yeah, I mean, I, we don't have much time to go into this, but I think this is a constant way of also making sure that we pick up what are actually the needs, what are the sort of challenges that those who we expect to actually deliver adaptation have. And, you know, you, you see here some, um, you know, the bottom one is relatively easy. I get this a lot, you know, what metrics can be used to assess resilience of the counterparty? So if you're an investor and you, you get that adaptation resilience important, but how, what, how do you know if that counterparty is more resilient than another one? If, if that company that you're setting up your supply chain with is better prepared for climate um, change? It's not an easy, there's no easy answer. And I think that just signals how important it is to, to reflect on stakeholder needs. And that just brings me to the end. So the third part of my three and one, um, there is, you know, a much better grasp of adaptation and resilience in the private sector, um, at least in parts of it. I mean, so, so I work, well, in the insurance sector, but I work a lot across sectors um, with basically the clients, the companies, but also government who need insurance and who need risk management advice. And I think the understanding has certainly shifted, but with that also the need for really clear, clear instructions and clear metrics and, and clear, clear information. And that just illustrates um, some of the work that we've been doing and we've just published last um, month a report saying about water, which uses terminology that a few years ago nobody in the private sector would have used and now it's kind of common I mean you know it talks about the need to relocate it talks about the need you know to recognize that protection is limited not everybody will will have access to insurance not everybody will have access to protection so that kind of language is starting to change and it's being being better accepted but I think we then need we as the sort of research community need to, to provide some, you know, some, some good guidance and information. And just in terms of presenting that evidence, and I know, um, you know, there's been a massive amount of, of research coming out that also picks up on these interdependencies. So in my discussions in the private sector, I think this is actually a real important way of illustrating where we are today, 
you know, what this means in terms of, you know, key elements of your supply chain. I often say to companies, well, I, I understand you might not be concerned about flood risk because you feel the location where your headquarter is isn't at risk. You know, let, let's talk about whether it's really not at risk. But then once you start thinking about the interdependencies, you know, suddenly people start realizing, you know, there, there are interconnections. And next week, I've been invited by the renewable grid operators um, in association. I think it's the wrong acronym. Anyway, in Brussels, and they've set up their first working group on adaptation and resilience. And, you know, that's, well, um, part of me thought, well, I hope it's really not the first time they're thinking about this. But it, at least it's an indicator that, you know, this whole discussion about net zero renewable energy needs also to reflect adaptation um, and, and resilience. Well, let's skip that because I think you're all very well versed in what it takes to deliver adaptation. Um, but yeah, it's, it's really, I think that sort of gives us a lens of what is needed to actually take account of all the good research evidence and, you know, the, the, the knowledge that we have and then translate that into, you know, into a shift because that's ultimately what it is. We need a transformation of how we deal with, with climate risk. And yeah, so here are my sort of five key messages need. Um, you know, I'm, I'm very happy to say that I think, you know, in all three of my roles, I fully stand behind those because, I mean, there is really an urgency to, um, you know, to sort of look at standard metrics, to look at integrated solutions, also to really have um, more focused adaptation research um, and realize policy market opportunities. And then I think the last point, we talk a lot about research. We also need good education. The skills challenge on adaptation is massive. And, you know, just to get you thinking, I talked to a colleague from PwC last week. They are planning to recruit, you know, not just in hundreds, but up to a thousand people skilled in climate and sustainability. And, and they wonder where these skilled people will come from. So, you know, there's a challenge, I guess, also for, for universities to, to take advantage of the research, but also focus on the education. So with that, I hope you could understand me in the back. It was not too slow. We managed to catch up and we have some time for discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed for your topic. Um, and we have got some time for discussion. Um, perhaps we could get the, the line on the screen here. And because it was on my phone and then it disappeared, so I don't know if it was going on on the side. Um, but uh, to start with, any questions in the room for explaining what we get? It's really interesting thought. Thank you very much. Um, when I look at the uh, social security point, what's really difficult is going from uh, research in the style of demonstrating a small scale to scale the research we need for, for industry. How do we do that scaling that takes us from one domain, one side, one location, one project, to having a fully adapted UK and everybody, every organization? Well, I mean, I guess it's. It's kind of like a fundamental question. I mean, research is there to really address, you know, the, the sort of big fundamental questions, give people, you know, an idea of the scale of the challenge. And I think then the translation of that um, is, is when you actually step more to the applied and in some cases to the consulting side, you know, then you, you make it more granular. I mean, often industry says, oh yeah, give, give me, I need this as asset level, you know, very granular. Okay. But, you know, we can't expect research to deliver that. I think that's where the translation needs to, to happen. Um, but I also think in some cases, research, you know, has, has actually, you know, really also a, a chance to, to challenge you know, conventional wisdom. And, you know, often people you know, are stuck to their understanding. So, for example, on interdependencies, this whole notion of how 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 systems happen and evolve. You know, you need the research for that. Yeah. Yeah, Murray. Thank you. Um, very useful 
information, thank you. Um, you mentioned about the fact that perhaps government are not so in tune with adaptation in the way that mitigation they have been for, for some time. In 2008, the Climate Change Act was a, was a key thing in, in our time frame, and that included the adaptation reporting power, obviously, which um, had a requirement for something like 170 organizations around the UK to be saying how they were going to adapt. And, and there have been uh, iterations of this over time. It seems that maybe is there an opportunity for contact um, from communities like ours into that group um, in order to engage them? Because you, you refer to the fact that there's a, there's a lack of um, joined up thinking, if you like, or, or coordination between different sectors. Um, maybe there's an, there's an opportunity there because that group exists um, through the ARP that they could be brought in, if you like, into the work that's going on in, in the research community and, and then ask them questions about what specifically do you need that you haven't got so far and how could we, you know, how could the research community meet your needs to, to stimulate that discussion? Yeah, I mean, I think the, you know, the, this is like a treasure trove, basically, the, the reports that we have. And it is, it's quite unusual. You don't have this in, in many other countries, I think it's fair to say. And it has triggered a lot of adaptation, you know, efforts within those those sectors, those organizations that have to report. I think I'm a great believer, you know, reporting is not for reporting's sake, but what do we then do with that? And do those people who have to report have access to you know the best tools the best information and what are their challenges when they actually fill in these reports so i think what you're suggesting there could could work quite well and i would even expand that it's not just the adaptation reporting powers um, that exist there's also a lot of reporting now happening in the private sector under the tcfd disclosure which usually falls really short on anything on adaptation. I mean, there's an opportunity to report on adaptation, but it's not really captured in there. And I think, again, that is an opportunity to say, when you do these reporting, it's great that you acknowledge your understanding of physical risk, but do you actually understand what you need to do about it? And I think that's that's important, yeah. I'm going to um, take a question um, online here, which is um, about how do we... Um, bridge the gap between um, academic research and end users who want to take action and adapt. And uh, Chigley, I'm going to add on a, a sub question to that, which is, is, is the flip side, um, because as you hinted, there's, there's a great deal of innovation going on in business in the moment, and what one might or might not describe as climate services. Um, uh, lots of very interesting analytical capability being developed. Um, in several respects, um, possibly exceeding what's going on in, in some research contexts. Um, I I'm, I'm often get to look at research proposals and I find myself saying, well, I know people in industry who are doing this already. Um, why are we asking for research funding for it? So, but part of the issue there may be a kind of lack of transparency in the sense that innovators and in research don't actually know what's going on in industry. Um, so, sorry, two questions there. One, but how do we bridge in both directions? Well, I mean, I think by and large, this is an area where that integration works relatively well compared to many other areas. At least we have a long history of close relationships of industry also sponsoring research and you know sort of people ending up working for companies then you know which I think is 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 good um I think the challenge there is obviously the time frame so you know research has a longer time frame than the need that a business has so you know if if, if you come with a business proposal um to, to me in my Marsh McLennan uh, with a research proposal my Marsh McLennan hat on then, you know, I would look at that, you know, more as a long-term investment rather than something that's going to help me right now. Um, I guess what I usually say, 
I think at the moment there is a, still a bit of a wild west scenario out there when it comes to climate analytics and, mm -hmm. and innovation. And I think research really has an important role to 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 hold the sort of ground truthing of this mm -hmm. and to to establish also, you know, some 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 really good principles because you know that is my other fear i mean i'm here talking about the great innovation i've also seen a lot of wrong assumptions and i've also seen a lot of you know the potential for maladaptation in that and i think that's an area where you know hopefully the research community can also you know be become stronger and and clearer yeah um please thanks very much and um, I mean, for sort of building on that, you highlighted the need in your conclusions as well for standards and metrics for adaptation. We had some really interesting discussion at the end of the day yesterday, and um, both about standards for climate services and also about the need for a national framework for climate services. And I was just wondering overnight, you know, and then through your talk, is that something that the Committee on Climate Change um, could or would consider calling for? So that's the first question. And then secondly, just following on your conclusions. You also noted in your conclusions, but you didn't say much about it, a need for an adaptation research centre in the UK, which I was very interested in. And I was wondering you know, what you meant by that and how far you see it going based on some of the other talks we had yesterday, Jason's point earlier about you know, how do we take successful pilots to scale? Um, I'm wondering if what we need is more of a, a research into use centre or a, a research translation centre for really looking at, we have all this brilliant research that's come out of this programme and many others, but we really need to think about, well, how do we actually scale that and also with the urgency that's needed? So, uh, yeah, really interested in your views on that. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, let's start with that last point. I completely agree. And it, you know, I, I'm not envisaging, you know, the sort of ivory tower idea of, of, of having, you know, it needs to be applied, definitely. I think this adaptation research center idea is basically there also to, to mirror, you know, what we've seen on the mitigation side and on net zero and, you know, the, the sort of really great work that's been happening. It doesn't mean that we're not doing great work on adaptation research, but it's really sort of, you know, spread across. There's still a lack of integration with economics, for example, and then also with, with the policy side. So I think that that was the, the thinking, you know, we, we need to add um, that. I think on the standards and metrics, I mean, we've been calling for that already uh, in a way. And I think I'm looking at Richard here, who's drafting the progress report, but it is one of the key messages you know, we, we, we need to have that. And that's, a, it could be sometimes a bit of a, seen as a trade-off because I know researchers get quite worried when you try and break something down into a single metric or a single vision. But, you know, we also need to be pragmatic because those who need to deliver adaptation, they need something tangible, yeah. Great, Swenya, I think we've got to draw the discussion to a close. Thank you um, all for that. In, and as you've gone along, actually, you've picked up some answers to some of the questions which have been appearing online. Apologies to um, everyone online who um, posted questions, but also posted some answers. So thank you for that as well. There's some debate going on there, so that's good. Um, but thanks very much indeed, Svenja, for um, a great presentation and, and very good discussion, which I'm sure will continue throughout the day. Okay, um, what we're going to do now is start to focus more through a set of panel discussions and inspirational talks um, on the implications of the research and the learning from UKCR for policy and practice. Um, this first session um, that I'm going to moderate focuses very much on the journey from hazard into risk, and we'll pick up other parts of the journey um, as we go through the other sessions. One thing I'm very keen that you also keep in mind is that although we might view it as a journey, we also need to think about the feedback. We also need to think, how do we take the lessons from practice back into the research on hazard and risk? So we're going to begin with a talk. Um, the talk is going to cover a number of the insight articles that we have been preparing uh, across the champion team and across the project. Um, and it's really going to set the scene, I think, for this. Uh, so Jennifer Cato from University of Exeter is going to start, then Nigel Arnell 
uh, is going to take over partway through. Then we'll move into the panel discussion. Can I also remind um, people on Slido um, that as we go through the session, uh, please put your questions in that uh, relate very much to the um, hazard and risk sector. What we'll do is when it comes to questions, we'll alternate between um, a few points that I want to, to bring out as we curate the discussion, the online audience and the in-person audience. So over to Jennifer. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Yeah, so I'm going to start by um, talking about um, a couple of the insight articles that we've written and um, thinking about hazards um, and through to metrics and risks. So I'd like to thank all of the contributors to the insight article that I um, led along with Simon Brown uh, from the Met Office. So the first of these articles uh, was thinking about improving the characterization and understanding of climate hazards over the UK. So within the UK Climate Resilience Programme, um, the hazards that were primarily um, uh, focused on were uh, things like extreme precipitation and the associated flooding, uh, extreme winds and extreme heat events. So in order to understand and characterize these hazards, um, there are a number of different strands within the projects. Um, so first of all, um, people making either producing new model data or making use of model data that exists. And there's kind of two complementary um, methods here. So first of all, making use of higher resolution information using the UKCP regional and local uh, model simulations to give more information about the, um, the high resolution structure of the, the hazards that we're seeing over the UK, but also using lower resolution uh, models to uh, produce larger uh, data sets, um, event sets, uh, particularly for the extreme events. Within the project, um, people were also focusing on the processes, um, understanding more about um, why we get hazards. And um, so looking at things like the urban heat island and compound flooding processes. Now, we wouldn't get a lot of these hazards without the weather systems that actually bring the hazards, for example, extreme precipitation and strong winds. So there's been a bit of a focus within the programme um, in understanding the driving weather events. And so, for example, fronts, seasonal weather patterns, um, organised convective systems. And finally, um, using uh, new developed statistical methods um, to produce um, more information, particularly about the rarer and more extreme events. So um, we saw some of this from Simon yesterday um, using generalised additive models and um, producing new data sets from these statistical methods on uh, rainfall and uh, flooding up uplift data sets. So um, to assist in characterising the um, hazards, um, a number of tools and data sets have been produced within the UK Climate Resilience Projects, and they're listed on the right here. Um, details of these will be in the Insight article, but if anybody's interested in them um, before that's available, um, please do let me know. Um, so these come from a number of different projects. So first of all, the tools, um, thinking about um, identifying different weather types, um, so front identification code, um, rainfall perturbation tool, looking at heat waves using the hot days tool and um, stochastic weather generator. And then the data sets of these hazards um, that can be used to explore um, more um, into the, the risk side of things. Um, compound flooding, um, a data explorer web page, um, case studies of compound hazards, um, storm type data set, rainfall flood uplifts, um, return levels and extreme winter scenarios. So using these um, new data sets and tools and um, some of the um, information that we've developed in the project on future hazards include um, changes, future changes to the seasonal distribution of extreme precipitation. Um, so seeing more extreme events uh, stretching into the autumn season. Organized convective systems are projected to double their precipitation in the future. Um, increases in the frequency of extreme windstorms over the UK. Um, which can pose risks to electricity distribution networks and a tenfold increase in the number of days of dairy cattle heat stress um, in the next 50 years. So um, the a summary of the, the first Insight article um, was uh, thinking about there are a number of uncertainties between the different model simulations that have been used. Um, so 
this means that it's essential to understand the physical processes of what's going on in these models in order to be able to interpret um, the, the model output. Um, we've developed new physical and statistical models um, to contribute to um, understanding worst case scenarios. Um, and there's been a, quite a focus on the physical uh, causes of hazards, um, which I think is, is really important. So future directions that were kind of identified in this insight article is we need a better understanding of the uncertainties between models. Um, so um, developing some constraints uh, to help us interpret those model uh, projections would be useful. Um, it was mentioned yesterday, um, would we like to have multi-model ensembles of cloud permitting models? That's something that we, we did actually um, decide would be uh, useful. And um, having produced these data sets and tools, um, we would now like to understand how they're being used. And um, I think that's really important uh, for future uh, work. Um, linking more with um, other uh, modeling. So for example, data from the cloud and uh, permitting models being fed into um, hydrological models um, requires a bit more interdisciplinary work. And then converting the hazard information that we've got into estimates of risks. And that will um, come in a moment. So I'll pass on to Nigel. Right. Uh, thanks so much, Jen. And um, again, I'd like to thank the co-authors of our Insight paper, where we're looking particularly at the range of research within the programme, which has sought to characterise metrics of climate change in terms of risk, in terms of assets, or in terms of indicators relevant to those seeking to improve resilience and enhance adaptation. So in a sense, we're a bit further on from the chain that Jen was talking about. We're essentially, in these suite of projects, been looking at taking information on climate projections and then translating them into measures of risk. Now, what we haven't done, because this is the next insight um, presentation, is to look at what that means in terms of impact, in terms of people exposed, you know, average annual damages, things like that. We've concentrated on, on the bit in between, if you like. It's measures of how climate is in, affecting risks in indicators that are relevant to making decisions about adaptation and resilience, rather than saying what's the you know, the, the, the overall cost of climate change to the UK. Um, so a range of different projects um, we, we summarised in the paper. Most of them, uh, all of them are using information from the UK CP18 climate projections, and I'm going to come back to that in a moment. And we covered indicators um, across a range of sectors, and I've just got some illustrations here. Oh, which one is it? We'll try that. Um, in the paper itself, we, we try and summarise these and pull together some results uh, in some quantitative results guess, across a range of sectors. And we've classified these in actually into the chapters that were used in the evidence report for the third climate change risk assessment to allow some sort of straightforward, hopefully easy mapping from one source of evidence onto another. I'm not going to go and describe all these um, elements of this table at the moment. The table is expanded in the paper with numbers, with illustrative numbers. So it gives a range of the idea of the spread of indicators that we've been calculating across the program. Um, and I think for the first time, we've probably got a pretty comprehensive assessment across the UK at quite fine and variable spatial resolutions using a consistent set of information, um, a series of metrics relevant to adaptation and resilience policy across the UK. Some of these metrics are presented on a website, which we I should have put on this list here, ukcri.org. Uh, ask me if you want more information about that. Um, and the, I guess the three things I want to, to highlight here are that, well, this is not rocket science and it's not breaking news. Most of the consequences of climate change in the UK are adverse. Not all, but most. And the ones that you might think are getting better don't necessarily get that much better that we can now forget about them. Um, and increasingly, um, the consequences become worse with higher emissions. But the next point is an important one, because almost all the evidence that we've managed to put together in that Insight paper was based on the UKCP very high emission scenarios, most specifically the UKCP 18, RCP 8.5. In my view, that doesn't map very closely onto the principles that we heard about earlier on about planning for two and four degree worlds. RCP 8.5 is not a four degree world. And there's a lot of inconsistency in the way this is interpreted in research and in practice, um, building onto some of the points that we had in discussion earlier on. So I think that's, a, that's an issue about how we can provide information from what we've got 
in ways that are more directly mappable onto policy suggestions and principles. And finally, we've, we've got some gaps, obviously. Um, there's been very little on indicators of ecosystem impacts across the um, programme, and that was primarily because of the nature of the programme. It was very much looking at human systems rather than ecosystems for themselves. Um, so that's a gap. Um, and there's some, but not much, on the risks associated with compound hazards. And we saw that pop up in one of the questions on the slide earlier on. I think that's quite an important gap. So that's a summary of the insight paper, which looks at how we've calculated across the program in a consistent and coherent way, using some subtly different um, interpretations of methods and so on, but broadly similar set of information to capture indicators and metrics that are relevant to adaptation and resilience. Back over to Jen for the last part. Thanks, Nigel. Okay, so the third insight article um, that we're covering is what has been learned about converting climate hazard data to climate risks information. And these slides were provided by Katie Jen Jenkins. So, so we've spoken about the, the hazards and the metrics that we can use um, that are more uh, relevant to decision makers. But in order to really understand the risk from these, uh, these things, um, we need a consideration of um, the hazards themselves, but also the vulnerability and the exposure and as you can see on the figure on the right, um, there's also a fourth um, part to that diagram, which is the response. So, so these three, the, these four things all feed into the, the risk that we see from, um, from the hazards. So within the UK Climate Resilience Programme, there've been a number of different approaches and methodologies uh, used to try to convert this hazard data into um, climate risk information. Um, so some examples are using qualitative mapping, threshold-based methodologies, um, simulation models, cat modelling, and systems-based approaches. So some of the key developments um, that were kind of um, found in, in this Insight article is um, making use of the local, regional, and global data, um, which can now be linked to the UK SSPs that we heard about yesterday. And um, so there's been progress in um, projections of the future exposure and vulnerabilities, which are key to being able to, um, to map hazard onto risk. Um, a number of data sets, similar to the first article, a number of data sets have been um, produced to better inform the assessment of changing climate risk. So you can see on the right, there's, there's three different categories of, of these uh, data sets. So the hazards, um, exposure and vulnerability, and then actual uh, risk data sets. So we, we still need more information about the hazards. So um, producing spatially coherent event sets um, of extreme events. Um, and there have been un advances in uncertainty uh, calculations. Um, and we, we need to under understand that uncertainty. So the summary um, of, of this insight article um, is that we need to really understand these climate vulnerabilities um, and exposure in order to be able to map the hazard onto the risk. And um, so, so that's, that's a key um, thing that we need to advance. And um, we also need uh, multiple risk frameworks and tools. So that's, that's something that has been uh, developed in the project, um, a number of different frameworks and tools um, for um, to inform different uh, stakeholders um, for the climate resilience and adaptation decisions that need to be made. Through the project, um, something that has been highlighted is the importance of working with uh, stakeholders in order to make sure that the um, information, the risk information is uh, relevant to those stakeholders. Um, so good communication between climate research and the impact sectors um, is uh, really important. A couple of knowledge gaps that were identified, um, some access to existing exposure and vulnerability data is very fragmented. So it would be great to have um, a repository where um, we could access this, this kind of data. Um, this is a real challenge when it comes to um, converting hazard into risk. Um, and another um, thing that's come up is the analysis of compound cascading and systemic risks um, could do with more attention, um, particularly when it comes to uh, national scale risk assessments. And so that's that's kind of a, a common theme throughout the um, different insight articles that we need more on, on compound events. And, and I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Thanks. So now we move into the 
uh, panel discussion section. So if we could have the panelists uh, come forward, please. Great, so let's start at the, uh, the other end and introduce our, our panelists. Uh, so first we have uh, Richard Miller from the Climate Change Committee. Um, Richard, do you want to say a little bit about what you do? Yeah, hi everyone. I'm Richard, so I'm the Head of Adaptation at the Climate Change Committee, so running our Secretariat Work Programme on the climate resilience side, which is one half of the work that the CCC does, with the other half being on emissions reduction. So the work that Svenja was mentioning this morning, we, we, we're the Secretariat to, to Svenja's committee. Thanks. Next, we have Paul Sayers from Sayers and Partners. Um, Paul, you'll get. I was just in. So, hello, everyone. I'm Paul Sayers from Sayers and Partners, Applied Research Consultancy, but also uh, have an academic position at UEA and represent a bit of Open Clim today as, as well. There's no one else in the panel for that. And uh, heavily involved in the past three climate change risk assessments around the flood side, particularly. Excellent. Thanks very much. We, I think we've heard from. Yeah, from, from Nigel. So, but... they never know. Less is more. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I probably will say we heard um, a lot of discussion yesterday on Open Clim. Um, it's, it's really exciting to to see how far they've got with developing the framework uh, and some of the example results. So it would be good if we hear more about that as well in the discussion. Uh, next up is one of my colleagues from the, the Met Office, Richard Betts, also from the University of Exeter. Richard, tell us a bit. Yeah, thanks, Jason. So, yeah, so I'm Head of Climate Impacts Research at the Met Office, also a professor at uh, Exeter University. Uh, I led the technical report for the third climate change risk assessment. Uh, and part of my time on that was actually supported by the UK Climate Resilience Programme. Uh, uh, as match funding alongside the, the 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 funding that came from the climate change committee to support this work uh, and this this, this, this program actually did actually feed in quite a bit uh, into the CCRA through technical report from the early stages of this program, but also a lot that we've seen in the last couple of days has, has been following on it's interesting to see how we're already learning more of what we knew uh, in the CCRA three report. I, 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 I didn't I didn't really get to introduce myself though I'm Jennifer Cattle from the University of Exeter and my expertise is really in um, understanding high impact weather events particularly mid-latitude storms um, how they form and how they'll change in the future um, yeah just thought it was worth introducing myself no oh, brilliant thanks very much um, so given this section is focusing on uh, policy and practice um, I'd like to ask the first question for all of the panel. Um, so what are the most important findings from the UKCR uh, project for policy and practice? And let's go back just the other way along. So thinking about the, the article um, that I led, um, I think one, one of the things is that there's still quite a lot to understand about the physical processes and the drivers of hazards. Um, so, so we're talking a lot about um, uh, looking at the, the impacts and the risks, but we still do need to understand more about what our models are actually uh, doing um, to produce the projections that we're using for our adaptation information. So I think um, that's something we, we still do need to do research on understanding processes and drivers. Um, we also found that there was quite a lot of model uncertainty, so work to um, understand that um, needs to continue. Producing more data sets so that we've got more hazard information um, is is something that we we kind of discovered uh, in the in the insight article that there's a lot of work going on um, to produce these data sets, which is which is great. Um, yeah. So Richard, very much the the emphasis on what has pulled through to policy and practice, I think in particular. Um, yeah. So I think there were some great examples of that. Uh, uh, as I said earlier, for, with the uh, early stages of the UKCR program, some of the results being used in the uh, CCRA3 report, which is now informing the National Adaptation uh, Program. Um, and as, as, as Jen said in, in her, her talk, the working with stakeholders is key here. And I think that it was obvious that did inform some of the research and also how it was framed, especially some of the work that Nigel led on, uh, the, the climate hazard indicators. As, as Nigel says, a lot of that was based on the UK CP18 projections and the, the very high emissions scenario, which is above the, the sort of two and four degree pathways which the, the CCRA3 was framing. But Nigel 
uh, led a couple of nice papers which actually used subsets of that information uh, constrained to meet these warming pathways of two and four degrees by the end of the century. So it made it more directly useful for what was needed in, in, in the report. And I think that was a great example of sort of stakeholder informed uh, uh, research, which really helped us uh, express it in the in the way that was needed. Thanks. Thanks very much for that, Doug. Um, the thing that struck me most when we're looking at the the work that's been done on the indicators of risk and, and hazard was how um, lots of people have applied, have used various bits of the UKCP products, and there's a lot of information out there. Um, different. Some parts of it have been better used than others, it's fair to say, um, and that has implications for how we interpret risks. Uh, and one of the other things that came clear when we're looking at how we translate this into practice is that um, there's we clearly need some guidance about or how we use climate information. There's a whole range of stuff out there, and it's overwhelming. And um, we can provide information a whole range of spatial scales with a whole range of different scenarios, making all sorts of assumptions. But we need guidance and advice about how we actually use that information. Because we can produce all the stuff until it comes out of our ears, but if it's not going to be directly related to how people use information, it's, it's going to be pretty useless. So it's getting some collective discussion about what we sh should be doing with adaptation and resilience and what information is needed to underpin that so we don't have to sort of cut corners and make approximations to try to interpret things from evidence that we otherwise collect. Quite a lot of points uh, in the panel before, so I'll try and make some slightly different ones perhaps from, uh, from, from, the, from our perspective. I think it's a quite a complex relationship between hazard and risk, so they're quite often trivialised that that uh, might be a layered relationship or a, a non-feedback relationship. And so that relationship between hazard and, and risk is quite a long, long chain um, to, get, to get reasonably good. So uh, an example might be some of the work that's on compound flooding. We know that that's, a, that's an issue and we're pretty good at sort of the trivial connection of wind happens at the same time as a flood. That's possible. But in fact, risk is more complicated than that. Remember the flout? Everyone remember the flout years ago? That uh, you, you get a drought and then three months later you get a, a flood. Well, your earth embankments all desiccated. They've now all got fissures. So there's a relationship between that event in quite a more complex way than a, than a simple overlay of hazard layers. We've got to be aware of that, that trivialization of that link between hazard and risk. I would also say that risk, you can't think about risk in the absence of adaptation. People quite think you do a risk assessment. Well, I think that's a, a nonsense. You have, to, you have to play in some form of adaptation associated with that. Like you wouldn't do a climate risk assessment, a climate change assessment in the absence of a mitigation assumption. So you have to do a risk assessment with some form of adaptation context associated with it. And uh, nearly on my final uh, final point from a uh, from a user perspective, and there, there are a couple of things that OpenClim is trying to do to make those connections in that more complex way. But one of the uh, aspects that perhaps we do uh, most of in the private sector is the integration. Jim mentioned the integration and same integration, and with the risk assessment, you have to decide what is. The touch points of integration because everything is connected to everything so what is the decision context and which are those real touch points of integration that you think you can you can make and that uh, did some work for the nic recently and that highlighted the link between how you manage surface water flow and combined sewer overflows so there's a really quite a strong integration link that people could act on i think Dr. jim's still in the room but he was making that point that they have to be action points of integration not just uh, we integrate how we do it. So that's perhaps one of the things that the private sector ha and open kid is trying to do is to highlight those real touch points where we can act. Yeah, thanks, Paul. Uh, I'd very much um, agree with all of that. And I think the work done by OpenClim really nicely sets us up actually to go forward and try and deliver on exactly that, on, on those points where, what were those, some, some of those key intervention points that are actionable and can deliver across multiple hazards. The other thing I'd add to what's been said already is I think the work that um, some of the most high 
leverage stuff i think that's been done in the program some of the stuff that nigel mentioned around turning the the weather and climate output into those indicators of risk i think that's so valuable because one thing we heard when we did the assessment of the third round of the adaptation reporting power is that you know people want to get to that risk relevant cuts of the hazards so having that easily accessible um and in a format that doesn't require necessarily being an overly expert user to to get to i think is is so valuable actually for enabling this to be much more actioned and much more broadly used by by a wider set of people beyond the expert community so i think um easy to underestimate i think the value of a tool like that to be able to have people get to the cuts that they're probably more interested in and um and access that information quite simply thanks I often think of the, 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 the adaptation process very much like you would business change process with the early stages around awareness raising and creating desire. And I think some of the metrics work fits in very much there. And then the, the open clim work and the cat modeling um, work. I think that then gives you the, 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 the knowledge and the ability to plan the adaptations perhaps in, in more detail. Let's take a question from the, the in-person um, audience. Um, there are two at the back. Um, let's go for on the left to start with, please. Is that Rachel? Hi, um, Rachel Brisley from Ipsos. I was also um, one of the chapter authors for CCRA3. Um, I just wondered, as the, the uh, CCC starts to prepare for CCRA4, um, what are the sort of big lessons or, or what, what can we expect to change in CCRA4 from um, the inputs from the programme? So what particular differences could there be from all the research that's been produced? Thank you. Okay, who wants to take that first? I'm happy to take that first. Yeah, thanks, Rachel. Um, yes, I think so. CCRA4, I, I mean, I think that we're at an interesting space in the climate risk assessment. I think as Svenja alluded to, some of the points been raised already that risk assessment um, probably needs to broaden out in, in what it means for it to be continue to be as useful and usable as possible, similar to the points that Paul raised about adaptation being a key part of it. So I think one of the things we'd really like to see next time is an increased focus on that value of adaptation. And also probably, I think, to acknowledge with the national risk assessment as well, that there's a very sort of technical ask and product for it. Um, but at the same time, it's a really key piece in the broader um, landscape of this and thinking about how we can get out some of those simple stories that really cut through to a wider set of people, to really the key decision makers who are not in thinking about this every day. How can we tell it in a simple way that really brings out what we do know? We don't get sort of just lost down the 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 avenue of complexity and uncertainty is important as all those are and really find compelling ways to tell that story um, that can cut through and I think that's something we should have as really top of the list of, of things we want to do next time is is thinking about that bigger ecosystem the broader narrative that cuts beyond the expert community and what can the risk assessment do to help us all really tell that story and, and get the key people we need engaged in government but also in business and yeah this wider set of people who we've spoken about already needs to be needs to be engaging with this topic you want to add something well not speaking for what's going to be in the ccra four because obviously that i'm not in in that loop but that, that remind oh sorry that reminds me of um everyone remember colin green he uh he he always used to say about uncertainty there's only one uncertainty and that's the rational doubt about the choice i'm going to make so you the uncertainties of importance in the risk assessment isn't solely, if you think of the adaptation side, isn't solely around what are the uncertainties in that quantification of risk, but what are the uncertainties in my choices of adaptation? Because they may be very small. They may be, they may be very clear how to adapt despite large uncertainties in the risk. So part of the process is definitely to focus on that rational doubt around the choice rather than um, I mean, the uncertainties in the underlying analysis is, is important, but the output for the um, you know who's going to make that choice is is that rational doubt. Thanks. I think we'll take another one from within the the room. Um, so if we can go to next to Rachel, <laughs> nice and handy for the microphone. Thanks very much. Um, my name is Olivia Rudgard. I'm a reporter at Bloomberg. Um, I cover uh, 
climate solutions. Um, I, I've got another sort of similar question about behaviour. I mean, I think a lot about um, people's responses to things and and how, you know, if people don't do anything, it's, it, it really doesn't matter how good the, their data is. So, I mean, how, how can you kind of, um, I, I suppose, uh, use things like communication platforms, journalists, things like that to communicate these things well and clearly outside of the people in this room? And, and to what extent does that kind of go into your assessments or your decisions when you're doing this research? I'm curious if you could sort of talk me a bit through that process. Thank you. Thanks. I think we'll start with Richard Betts on this one. Thanks. That's a really great question, a really important one. Um, and uh, yeah, one of the challenges is uh, getting people to think about uh, adaptation to things they've just not experienced before. Uh, there's uh, uh, a lot, a lot of awareness of, of uh, things which are already hazards like like flooding, and many many places uh, experience flooding, and, and people that are exposed to flooding are perhaps aware it might happen more often or more severely. But uh, but to extend that example, some areas will become increasingly at risk of flooding, and uh, there's there's less awareness and less preparedness there. But perhaps some preparedness because they know that flooding is an issue. But then there's other things kind of coming from left field, like wildfire, for example, uh, is becoming an emergent issue for the UK and we're just not prepared for that at all but other countries uh, are already uh, well set up to deal with fire to a certain extent so looking at those examples of where these uh, hazards uh, exist elsewhere in the world and are and are dealt with to some extent can really help so I think in the communication side picking up on uh, existing examples and putting them in the context of, uh, of here uh, and, and making it kind of more real, I, I think, could really help. Thanks. Jennifer, do you want to have a go? Yeah, sure. Um, so I think that talking to, to stakeholders um, to find out what the key information is that would help them to make change is really important. So, um, for example, um, I'm involved in projects uh, talking to the reinsurance industry. So so what's, what is the information that they need in order to make a change that would benefit their their business? So, so I guess that's um, that's that's one way to make sure that the hazard information or the the risk information that you provide is actually of use. So, to, to build that in from the start. No, I, I, we'll just take one more, Nigel. We've not heard from you for a bit. Uh, right. Um, so the. What I want to say is related to the, the climate risk indicators website that we constructed, which was in a sense an afterthought from how do we provide information or all the results of this study that we, we've done. We've provided loads of information, got loads of indicators, loads of scales. How do we make it accessible? And that's fine. But and we tried to make it friendly, but it was very much top down. And if we we're doing it again, we would say, what do, what do we want? What information do people need? How do you want to present it? How do you want to deal with confidence and uncertainty? How much do you want guidance on what's right and what's the most effective way of using information and so on? So we've we, we've sort of assumed that if you just dump the information out, it's going to be used. And that's clearly not the case. So if we were to do that again, we would start that process the other way around. And I think that's that's really quite an important thing to do. Work out what is going to be useful and then providing the information in a way that's going to be interpreted um, most straightforwardly. Thanks, Nigel. There's a timing issue as well, isn't there? I mean, I think this is emerging in the literature around climate services that when when somebody actually has the, the the decision to be made, when the demand is there, that there's much like much more likelihood of uptake of the results. I think too often in the past we've tended to push from the the science community, uh, and if it's not an issue that's at the top of somebody's agenda, it's not on there because it's perhaps uh, not taken up in a, a risk register, um, then I think you have a uh, you have an issue with the uptake. Um, let's go online to some of the questions now. They've been building up. Uh, there's been some upvoting. Um, so the top one: um, How much should future research focus on calculating hazard right. metrics again with new data sets outside UK CP18 um, versus exploring risk and hazard knowledge gaps? Um, so I'm going to focus that one. Um, I think on Nigel first, um, and then we'll sort of expand out from there. Um, okay. Well. So my response is, what do we mean by new data sets outside UK CP18? Because the answer depends on what we're interpreting. If that new information is information about policy relevant emissions pathways, then clearly yes. If it's just another set of climate models, then I'm not sure what the extra value is going to be in that, but it might be important. But I think to me, it's um, providing information along uh, to answer the sort of questions we had earlier on about planning for two and preparing for four or whatever the phrasing is. Um, so I, I, 
but I think exploring the gaps is probably going to be more helpful than cranking the handle again with some more climate projections. So I would say there's there's a huge wealth of information within UK CP18, uh, which, which will stand us in good stead for many years. Actually, it's not just about the very high emissions scenario, although a lot of it, a lot of the projections are using that. There's also the other scenarios as well. And as we said earlier, even the high scenario can be used appropriately um, for low levels of global warming, for example. Uh, but there's all these different strands uh, of the projections using different types of models and different techniques. Um, so there's so much there which we, we can use. I think the challenge is, is to make it uh, understand, help people understand which bits of the projections are the most appropriate for them and how to bring together the different bits when there's when we're looking at uh, yeah, compound risks uh, and so on, which require information from different parts of the projections. So that's, that's where I think we should prioritise, actually. Thanks. Paul? Uh, so definitely put my open clim hat on in, uh, in put my open clim hat on in response to this uh, question. So one of the things open clim is doing is is thinking about uh, how different aspects of the landscape and urban exposure might evolve in time. So uh, using the SSPs, but also how the catchment might change. So agricultural demand, um, biodiversity, and how that might uh, be coupled together to think about then natural flood management in terms of a hazard response and how the SSPs downscale to much more granular information on where we might develop and where we might not develop. So it's, it's building on UK CP18 and the SSPs, but has a whole series of next level down uh, information, particularly around scenarios of how that exposure and the hazards might evolve. Thanks. I can't resist coming on this this one myself as well as, as lead on UK CP18. Um, so I think one of the philosophies around uncertainty is that actually we need to take multiple lines of evidence into account. UK CP18 does that and it's one line of evidence, but we also need other data sets alongside it. So I, I saw flash up actually from one of the other questions uh, mention of CMIP6 data. Uh, and large initial condition ensembles. I think they can be used alongside the UK CP18 uh, data. And that, I think we're seeing in some studies starting to, 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 to happen. People are into comparing and taking the best from UK CP18, but also complementing it with um, both model um, estimates from other studies, um, but also other lines of evidence like physical reasoning, um, like evidence from from paleo and that that question of what do we need in order to inform the user decision um, is I think well let's take as much as we can from from, from all of these um, okay I'm going to take another one from online so uh, Rachel James uh, hi Rachel um, has got uh, a question focusing on the, the international angle. So are there lessons for other countries in how to assess climate hazard and risk? Um, especially if other countries have limited resource, um, what, uh, what should they prioritize? And that kind of builds on something, Richard, I think you were saying earlier, that was the other direction of what can we learn from other nations? This kind of sums up that it perhaps should be a two-way uh, exploration. So I'm gonna start with uh, Richard Miller first on this one. Yeah, thanks, Jason. Um, I think there's definitely things we can learn both ways so i'd say we do actually quite a lot of this at the ccc there's um people who come to us either through government or um through other avenues to to hear more about the uk infrastructure for a once for better word on on climate policy across mitigation and adaptation and i think what's really powerful in many of those conversations is the the formality in some ways of the framework that's established so the the method of past ccras to focus on urgency that's a point that cuts across i think and often seems seems useful to others but i think there's loads we can learn as well and um you know i think it's particularly as we take this next step hopefully to to keep evolving our architecture so that we can hopefully support this this you know continued focus on risk assessment but on on delivery i think there's loads of lessons from how others are doing this around around the world as well that that we're wanting to learn right now so i think it's definitely a two-way conversation um and 
yeah, I think I think a lot of it is is that architecture, and I think that is a really valuable lesson. Um, stepping even out of the risk assessment to to the, the the policy structure, so the Climate Change Act, the obligation for a um, this this assessment to happen. I think it's easy to underestimate just the value of of the structure that that requires that for for there to be progress reporting, for there to be a required government policy program to respond to the risks. I think it's often those things that cut through as well as the details of of how risk assessment is done. Uh, Richard, next, I think. So one of the things um, I found most useful uh, uh, when doing the CCRAC technical report was the very clear exam question that had been set by the Climate Change Committee, uh, which was, what should the priorities be in adaptation? So everything we were doing, uh, were, uh, it, it, it boiled down to being able to make this prioritisation, because uh, there's vast amounts of information. How do you cut through this? You have to have a clear focus. And the, the, there was a clear method established uh, or by the CCC and also by Paul Watkins, who was here yesterday. I think he's not in the room now, but he's part of our author team. A very clear and simple method for uh, uh, prioritising all the different risks in terms of urgencies, as, as Richard said. Uh, and that really helped when you got a, uh, a lot of uncertainty in the in the, in, in the evidence. Uh, and, you, and often there's kind of gaps in the evidence. You're required to make a judgment on a uh, you know, assessment on a particular risk. Uh, if if it just comes down to, is it going to really make change your urgency scoring between like uh, very urgent and, and less urgent? Uh, that helps you decide how important this is. If if it's somewhat technical and nuanced, it doesn't really change the scoring. You don't worry too much about it. Uh, but if it is uh, big enough to help change the scoring, then that's where you put more attention in. So that kind of clarity of the question and the level of granularity that was needed was was very helpful. I think other countries. Would, could learn a lot from from that. I find it very useful. Okay, um, let's go for another one from within the in the room. Who'd like to ask a question? Uh, there's, there's, there's there's one there from Sarah. Hi, I just wanted to ask um, what the panel felt were the the key successes of the program and um, how this is made some way into changing the way we uh, look at climate change in this country. That feels like a question for all. So let's start with uh, with Jennifer and work along. Key successes, oh, that was. Um, um, I think there's been a lot of successes, um, particularly thinking about the Insight article I was involved in. Um, combining physical understanding and statistical techniques. Um, so I'm thinking about the hazards um, to, to really better understand the hazards that we experience in the UK, I think is a, a key success. And then also the some of the interdisciplinary um, projects that enabled um, the linking of the, the understanding of the, the weather um, with the actual impacts on the ground, I think um, is a key success. Thanks. I, I had two, but Jen has stolen one of them already on the multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary nature, I think was a, a great success. But the other one I was going to mention was actually the way the programme was structured uh, uh, as a partnership between UKRI and the Met Office. And that links to the to the uh, interdisciplinary nature, actually. Uh, uh, so it, it enabled a lot of the kind of core climate modelling and so on within the Met Office to be exploited, but also the a much wider diversity of expertise in, in the wider academic, academic community, but working closely with uh, the climate modelling side, I think was really valuable. I'd go even further, Richard, in that we were also able to bring in um, colleagues from government, colleagues from the private sector. Uh, and I think that diversity was was really quite, um, quite broad, even compared to other academic programmes. Well, for me, one of the most striking successes of the programme, I think, has been the discussion around what is meant by the word resilience. Um, because you know, in, in IPCC, we used to traditionally have an argument at the beginning of each round what all these words meant. And we usually agreed on the definition that was agreed the one before the one before. So it's a bit of a cycle. But one of the things that has become clear out of this process is that the, the different interpretations of what we mean by resilience very much influence what we think is important. And it's different in different parts of the research community. It's different in different parts of government. Um, and having this sort of forum to talk about what is meant by resilience, I think, has, has proved to be very helpful. Yeah, I think, I think there's been quite a few. Uh, our understanding of flood risk and how and the nuances of that 
and how different aspects of portfolio respond contributes to that have all been in, improved and the spatial work has all been improved. I would say uh, our international ability to sell our approach has also uh, been advanced. So uh, I'm part of a World Bank framework with JBA uh, doing climate risk assessments for different countries in different uh, places. And that in part is supported by our work, work in these type of programs, which is quite useful. And um, reflecting on the previous question, but it connects to a, a little bit of this, of what we can learn. In many of those other countries, pro-poor and gender climate risk assessment is central. And some of that we do here, but we could, we could do that more. We do cool. some social vulnerability issues. Um, so I think, there's, I think there's been a whole range of things, but particularly our ability to understand in a much more nuanced way the contribution of different adaptations to that risk outcome. I think that has been a, a real advance in the last few years. I would echo, I think, a lot that's gone before. What I would add, I think, is the value of something like OpenClim to have done that proof of concept of how you do that more um, systematic risk assessment and crucially that adaptation work that, that Paul was just mentioning. I think the value of that is huge because it shows us there's been a huge amount of architecture built for that. I think it sets us up to now hopefully try and move into this new phase of, of how, how we think about risk and resilience within, within the UK, that increased focus on adaptation. I think the value of just showing that, building the structures, yeah, is massive and I think sets us up nicely for for what's to come over the next few years. I'm going to follow up on that question with what could we have done better? And let's come back the other way with this one. What could we have done better? Um, I'm sure there's there's loads, uh, like in any program, I think loads has, um, has been done. Um, I think I think what's key, I think, to, to really use the outputs of the project, uh, of the program in the round is to link it, all the hazard information that this project's really usefully developed with all that stuff on vulnerability and exposure. So I think that is an extension, I think, that, that can, be, can be done, more can be done on over, over the coming years, I think, is to, to make, make ways to really intersect all that useful hazard information with the asset stuff. You know, I think that's sort of starting from the assets, thinking about what are the ways that those are impacted, how are they vulnerable, and then being able to bring in all this, you know, much more advanced cut of the of the hazard data that we have from the program is definitely, I think, something that, that, that there is more to do on um, and I'm sure will be done over the coming years. It's always a tricky one, tricky one that, uh, Jason, but I, I would say you, you could possibly reflect on the short duration of the program. And um, I think it, uh, one of the speakers at the start mentioned it, that you get really good things when you have not a program, actual things set out in the future because things change, but a, pro, a sustained program of activity um, that new people can enter and new people can join and new advances can happen. I, th I think that's a, a really good thing rather than although this was quite a long program, rather than that program-based uh, uh, approach. Uh, the point I'd like to make is something that Jim mentioned earlier on, in the sense that the steering committee and the structures that were appeared after the program started. Um, and if you were to do it again, I think you'd do it there around, clearly. Um, but also, a lot of the stuff that's gone on in the project has basically been, the project has some of its parts in many senses, and the pulling it together has been towards the end. Um, we've, in all the various indicators we've calculated, we, we haven't really come to a judgment as to whether, which are the most important. You know, did we need to bother looking at that one? And have we missed something really important? So some sense of perspective beforehand about what is it that's really going to be important? What is, where are the gaps that we really need to make, we need to fill in order to advance adaptation and resilience? and start that way round. Um, we've got a lot of that information now. Um, so if there's a phase two, I think you start the other way round. But you, you, arguably you couldn't have done without working out what's there anyway. It's, it's a chicken and egg uh, situation. Thanks. Well, from a CCRA3 perspective, having started a year early would have been great. <laughs> because <laughs> a lot of the stuff that came out since would have been uh, re really useful. That's, that's a bit facetious really. But uh, I think what one thing 
on a serious point, though, it is thinking about the timing of these research programmes uh, and the alignment uh, with co policy cycles you know, like, like the CCRA uh, and IPCC uh, and so on as well. Um, so what I would like to see now is to make sure all, all this stuff that's coming out of the second half of UKCR does properly feed into uh, CCRA4 uh, and probably the next IPCC uh, cycle as well. One of the problems with the traditional kind of UK funding model, which is project and programme based, is that when the funding comes to an end, there's a real danger of the communication dropping off and papers get published. UKCR papers will be published for another year or two, probably. Um, we need kind of press offices and communications teams still working on highlighting that for the media and pulling through to policy and so on. So that needs to keep happening. And ideally maintaining the community that we've built throughout the, the, the programme. Absolutely. Yeah, I don't think it's necessarily what could have been done better, but um, similar to what others have said, I think thinking about what happens now. Um, so a lot of these tools and data sets have been developed and I think it's really important that they are maintained and um, can be used going forwards. Um, all, all this knowledge that we've generated, we need to kind of keep going with it. Um, we don't want it to be forgotten. Um, and w one point that I wanted to make was about linking the hazard to risk and um, the vulnerability and exposure data that we need in order to do that. Often that's proprietary and um, it can be difficult to to get hold of that data. So that's um, it, it would be good to have more information about the vulnerability and exposure in order to be able to really make that that link. But yeah, making sure that things last going forwards, I think, is is really important. Thanks. Quick question. Yeah. While you take the microphone, I'm just going to add to the, the response on that, because I think from, from, from my perspective, we've built the science plan um, around helping to inform the CCRA process. Um, I think now there is a particular gap around the NAP process and actually pulling through to how do you optimise um, in the, the optimum way? How do you optimise in a, a place based um, uh, uh, way? So, uh, yeah, great to hear your, your feedback. Uh, but uh, looking forward to CCRA 4 and, and, and 5, uh, I wonder, uh, we need to go to coffee shortly, but so you need to be brief. Uh, but could you tell us what you think is the key research gap we need to fill over the next couple of years and how it will, you know, inform CCRA 4? Well, like, why, why, would it, why will it make a, a difference to, to CCRA 4? So let's go for Richard first, uh, then we'll see if we can squeeze in two others, maybe. Yep, um, really good question, Suraj. So my take on it would be, I think we need more information about the effectiveness of adaptation. I think we need that because we need to, I think it's that point I raised earlier about cutting through outside the, the people who focused on this already and telling that story about the agency we have over this, I think. I think that's really important for, for getting that wider engagement is be able to tell a positive story, I think, about what you know, what life in the UK could be like in the middle of the century, despite climate change, if we get on with improving our resilience and being able to sort of show that about how, you know, we can get to uh, a healthy, you know, pr a prof um, prosperous society, despite the challenges we'll face, if we deliver on what we know we can do with resilience, as well as reducing our, our emissions and, and helping the, the globe do that. And I think more information we have to be able to make that story rich, make it simple, make it um, visual as well, I think, in a way that can cut through to a much broader set of people who at the moment probably find this still quite vague, I think, of a sense of really, you know, there's all these risks from climate change, don't really understand them, don't really get uh, what agency we have over it. I think what we can do to, to tell that story about what we can do, make it compelling, is, is the key thing for me. Thanks, Richard. I'd say a key knowledge uh, gap is what what is the uh, the worst case high end scenario we need to be thinking about from a risk assessment perspective, both in terms of uh, long term emissions, which are really hard to constrain, even though we know what policies countries are signing up to, we don't really know what, what that's gonna how it's gonna pan out. But it's not just about emissions, it's also about response to the climate system and feedbacks and tipping points and climate sensitivity. How likely is four degrees global warming by the end of the century or or higher still? Uh, and the, how likely are high levels of sea level rise and so on. I think there's a really uh, important area which is leads a lot, a lot more work still, I think. 
Jen, if you want to take Yeah, I've got a point following up on that. Yeah, I think um, that there's a bit of a push towards a storylines approach. Um, and so given given these uncertainties that you, you talk about, um, this is one way to kind of um, look into what the different plausible scenarios are for the future um, and, and, and what adaptation would mean for those different scenarios. I'd be quite keen to see the best of the, the storylines approach and the best of the likelihood approach taken rather than it being a, a sort of competition between one or the other. I also think there's a really big gap around uh, cascading uh, risks and impacts as well that um, I think we're starting to have the tools to to, to, to address those, but, but not quite yet. Um, go on, squeeze in your, your last word and then we'll, we'll finish up the coffee. It's only a 10 minute response, is that? We, uh, you, you, you can face, <laughs> face the audience. So I, I would say um, the biggest gap is, is our ability to communicate adaptation as compellingly and as clearly as we can mitigation. That's a nice short one. That's that's thank you. So we're going to... My mind was longer. <laughs> yeah. So we're going to wrap up now. Um, I think that's been a really good session. Um, we've heard about some of the developments in hazard and risk. We've heard about how they're being used. We've heard about the gaps. Um, in the later sessions, we're going to take that story forward. And hopefully some of those ideas around communication, um, how we bring in communities, how we bring in different actors, um, we'll, we'll, we'll see how we've started to do that within the program. Uh, it'd be good to hear from you maybe later uh, at the end, uh, Richard, whether um, or how they could go further still. So if we can thank the panelists, and and now we can go to, to coffee. Um, where is the coffee? The second floor. Great. 11.05 to come back then. Yes.
now from risk into adaptation. And the title of the next session is Climate Risk Management Through Adaptation. My name is Albert Kleintank. I'm the director of the Met Office Hadley Center. And I was asked to step in to chair this session. And I think I mentioned yesterday at the opening session that my focus and my expertise is more in the in the very start in the physical hazards rather than, than in adaptation. But I think the good thing from the UKCR project is that it has really helped and contributed to the Met Office shifting also into um, risk and adaptation space. And rather than simply throwing the data across the fence, it's very much more now uh, collaboration and co-creation and co-development. And I think that is really has a good, has a, has a good effect on Met Office science. Uh, which is, of course, of my interest. Maybe also indicating my personal interest in adaptation. Um, in my previous job, um, I was um, in the Netherlands, and of course, the Netherlands uh, has a long history of adaptation. And actually, my home in the Netherlands was about 25, 26 meters below sea level, and I always felt safe. So there is really an adaptation and adaptation history here. Um, and I was in, involved in, in quite a few adaptation projects. So I'm really keen to hear the latest also coming out of the UKCR project on adaptation. Um, and I think we have an excellent uh, set of panelists, which I will introduce later. Um, we also have, again, uh, for everyone online in particular, but also here in the room, we have Slido is uh, active again. So you don't need to wait for any question on adaptation. You can already use Slido and, and ask your question. Um, and before we come to the panel, we have also in this case, in this session, um, two insight papers produced by the UK, by the UKCR consortium, consortium. And these will be introduced by also two of our panelists. And I think we will take the order that Kate Smith from University of Hull will go first. And her insight paper is on learning from arts and humanities approaches. Um, Kate, the floor is yours. I have been told you need to really speak into the microphone, please, so. Oh, good. Right. Hello. So I'm here on behalf of a very varied and diverse group of practitioners, uh, scholars and practitioners from across the UK representing five projects within the Arts and Humanities wing of the Climate Resilience Programme. And I kind of feel like I should say now for something completely different because my slides and the slides that Kate's going to share are somewhat of a different tone. So the arts are important because they help us to make sense of our lives. They integrate our external and our internal worlds in experience that we get to share with each other. And for resilience, we know that they have a really important role in communicating big, complex scientific ideas. And they have a crucial role in making global narratives about adaptation and mitigation meaningful in our daily lives. The humanities history, literary studies, language studies, culture studies, they all point to ways that we can help people to make sense of those complex and uncertain climate futures, helping to bridge some of the gaps that others have pointed out this morning about translating hazard into risk and thence into action. And taken together, they push us to consider that building effective resilience looks like what, what it looks like. And that has to include going beyond just the transmission of facts and data and hoping that this alone will have an impact because there's abundant research that says it doesn't matter how shiny your science is if you just stand up and give people facts it doesn't actually make much change happen and what we've been trying to do is use the arts and humanities as tools to help all of us understand the way that this work can be done better and understand the impacts of what we're doing so these are the different projects we have a wide variety spanning the the breadth and depth of all the work that's happened across the arts and humanities. So starting with a folk pageantry, which we fitted in Hull, Plandage has happened in a, a wide spatial range. Uh, we've had some Northern Irish stuff about uh, extreme weather and the Time and Tide project that circumnavigates more or less the whole of the UK coast. Uh, so the Creative Climate Resilience Project uh, used traditional tropes of folk pageantry. So the kind of parades and spectacles that people do <coughs> normally in their everyday life. They use that to explore the way that place and culture are perceived, highlighting personal connections to changing climate and how that stimulates action for climate resilience. And using local lenses like this is a really effective way of magnifying climate issues at a local scale and connecting people's past and present and future 
to drive anticipatory action for individuals and communities. The time and tide bells positioned all around the coast give people a really tangible, audible, sensory way of engaging with things like rising sea level and change, how that's going to change the way our seascapes work. Rising sea level is really hard to see. We're like frogs in the saucepan there because it's happening, but it's really difficult to observe because the sea's always moving. And installations like this give people a way of engaging with that kind of uh, phenomena on a really uh, a local based, meaningful level. And the creative storytelling gave way, uh, gave a way for people to look at place-based data combined with their own response to extreme heat waves and map those across, as you can see, uh, Ireland there. The Risky Cities project, uh, we've centred on using dialogue and participatory approaches to foster knowledge exchange and co-creation. Uh, making space for people to confront climate challenges and climate futures. And we used historical maps and archive data as well as literary histories to stimulate participants to explore their own experience and articulate some of their hopes of what climate futures could look like. And we made sure throughout that work that we embedded equity and social justice because adaptation has to include that, otherwise it's not really going to work. Uh, the Clanders project used heritage materials to generate stories and other things about climate and weather extremes, linking people up, and we found this as well in Hull, linking people up with their local archives to uncover stories of how people have dealt with environmental challenges in the past. It's a really powerful way of bringing into dialogue um, the reality of those past environments and our responses to future climate challenges, especially, and what we find in the archives isn't the stories of tragedy and disaster. Generally, the things that we unlock are resilience and tenacity and resourcefulness and that's really important for giving everybody hope in order to be able to adapt and finally uh, we you all of us we need to know whether what we're doing has worked uh, the projects that i've briefly highlighted here and that we talk about in the insight paper a bit more show that the arts and humanities can be both a method and a model for doing this and i've shown that building effective valuation is crucial for demonstrating impacts. And we've been able to do that because we built it in from the start. And this is all the more important because we know that there is work to do in making arts and humanities impacts legible and legitimate to some people who are still very wedded to the idea that the only kind of knowledge that matters is scientific. The problems of climate change are interdisciplinary in themselves. <clears throat> and they're bigger than that somewhat old-fashioned epistemological dilemma that science and art can't really talk to each other. We need all the disciplines working together. We need all the evidence to be accepted as legitimate, particularly if we're going to integrate climate and arts and intercultural policy and bring about the climate resilient future that we will hope for. Thank you. Over to the, other, the next case. <clears throat> Yes, yeah, so I'm. So I'm presenting on behalf of um, Freya Gary, who's un unfortunately unable to be here. So these are not my slides, and I'm, I'm I can't take any credit at all for anything on on this or in the insight paper. In fact, so this insight paper brings together learning from the pro projects that considered how um, climate adaptation and resilience have resonated with place, and there is some overlap with what Kate has been um, sharing. So, you know, unlike climate mitigation, perhaps, which is, you could see as a sort of global collective effort, you know, we often say that adaptation is context specific um, and it sort of, it needs to be tailored to specific contexts of people and place. And it also requires coordination between multiple local actors um, that who often have very different interests at very different agendas. But on the positive side, you know, working together, you can work on multiple agendas at the same time. So, you know, we heard quite a few examples of this yesterday um, from uh, the Magic Project, for example, of if you do bring in sort of urban um, drainage systems into a local community, you can also have create green, new green spaces. Um, um, the concept of space, of place has different um, interpretations across disciplines, but it's very different from a word like location or resolution. It's not just about the physical aspects of that location. It's, it's also about the cultural, social, sensual, 
psychological values that people hold. So it's about, you know, memory and identity. And people have a very strong affinity with these things. You know, the National Trust talks about spirit of place. You know, it's, and it, there is actually a term, solastasia, solastalgia, for the sense of um, distress and grief that can be associated with the loss of a loved place. Um, but place is also never a settled thing. You know, it's always changing. It's always in a process of becoming. It's continually emergent. It's negotiated. It's contested um, and renegotiated. So in the in the program, there were a number of different um, projects that, that were really thinking about place. Um, so in terms of the local scale, and Clima Care was working in uh, social care settings, so actually in buildings. So thinking about how the quality of buildings and um, <clears throat> how they're constructed and operated and managed um, and how that Im impacts um, sort of future planning. Um, Clandage, we've already heard about from Kate, you know, used a historical lens to understand how rural communities have adapted and responded. So it gives this idea that, you know, change has always happened and people have always adapted and we can learn from that. At the neighbourhood level, we've got MAGIC. So MAGIC worked in Hull. It explored how um, flood-prone communities can work together to hold back rainwater in their neighbourhoods and be engaged in that process. And they took five community buildings, including a church, a primary school, a general store, and used that as a focus for local engagement. Um, and sort of thinking about how, using arts-based methods, again, stimulate discussion, to think about how the rainwater could be held back, but also you know, how you might design and implement, you know, and actually implement practical responses. Um, so the Creative Climate Resilience, again, we've heard from Kate, it's focusing on community knowledge and creativity in the next industrial um, ward in Manchester with a high level of social housing. And it used these arts and community-based performance methods and practices um, to think about how that could, you know, engage people and sort of raise awareness and uh, think about how they might um, think about climate mitigation and, and adaptation. And by taking a ward boundary, um, it was they were able to work with the local authority to think about what yeah. it means at a city scale. Um, and other city-based projects. So we got the London Climate Change uh, Climate Action um, Project, which was looking at the urban subsurface and sort of what's underneath the ground. And it was thinking about what's there that could help deliver the City of London's climate action strategy. Um, then the, in the, the Met Office work around meeting urban user needs, there's a whole set of urban city packs that we heard about yesterday, working across a num many cities now, um, so how you access and interpret local and climate information for decision making. And I think what's interesting there is that although they all had quite similar requirements in terms of the actual information, every city was quite unique in their capacity to interpret and use that information. So you, you did need that close working together. Um, and the Manchester Climate Action um, was an embedded research project working with the Manchester Climate Change Agency. And it de demonstrated that at a city scale, you need you know, climate change doesn't literally come first. You need to align with the municipal drivers and the characteristics of that place. And that alignment's necessary to get traction on adaptation when there may be many other drivers of change. And that led to a vision for progressive climate resilience um, that's been implemented across the city. Um, and then sort of finally at the regional one, which we've also again heard from Kate the, in Northern Ireland, once upon a time. Um, and that's also bringing in an idea of you've got places and you've got contrasting places and you've got starting to get the emergence of networks as well and networks between places. So that um, so the, the, the project as a whole has kind of come up with a, a set of principles that sort of reflecting on these different ways of thinking about place. Um, so there are six key principles. The first one is that climate action and adaptation is much more likely to be effective if it acknowledges and is congruent with a local sense of place. Um, but perhaps that's not to, to be developed at the expense of addressing wider structural issues that limit both climate action and adaptation such as achieving joined up policy making. The second principle is that place is relatable. This is where we, we as individuals 
can understand what it means to be in a place. We, we have associations with it. It's where implications of climate change become personal and tangible. Um, and that attachment is important. Um, and it can also be used to evoke a sense of urgency around the necessity of adaptation and sort of energize um, policymakers at local scales. Um, the third principle is that places change over time. They don't stay static, as do cultural norms. Um, and having a very set idea of what a place is can be really restrictive. You know, places don't stay in aspects. They, they need to be allowed to grow and develop. And our, our reflections on, on those places need to grow and develop. But understanding history of a place is really important, how that place has evolved and adapted over time, um, and how this will be influenced by climate change. It's vital to understand this to understand what's possible in the future uh, and what will facilitate and inhibit adaptation. Um, well, no, this one. Yeah, so that understanding local vulnerability is vital for realizing adaptation um, and decision makers also really need to be attuned to inequality across between different places um, and inequalities and inequality within existing decision making around the place is a major barrier to adaptation but one that really must be understood and confronted um the so the fifth principle is around creativity and community and kate's already um spoken about this um so it's not a, places are not about just buildings and infrastructure we must engage with people in those places and storytelling and float floor um, have been used in the program and uh, very effectively and it's a good way to sort of other community knowledge and creativity and also to understand what barriers might be and what the solutions might be um, and so sort of with the community has when they have a common threat or a sense of it, it can unite communities um, or or more positively a sense of purpose um, and developing pros proposals with local people not only helps to shape the adaptation outcome to meet their needs but enhances their local understanding of the need to adapt and the final principle um, is around connecting places so places connect not only the people in that place but also the different scales from national to city to building um, and the distinctiveness of particular places and their similarities with other locations are, are useful reference points um, and a, a locus of people to connect um, so place is distinct but it's also nested in these scales these different scales from local regional to national okay thank you very much thank you kate and kate can i ask you to take the seats in the panel on the front oh you're not gonna <laughs> okay good um so, and I'm also going to invite the other panel members, um, Dan McCartney from DEFA, Dan, welcome. Lucy Villarkin, Bristol City Council, you're already here. Welcome, Lucy. And Emer O'Connell from the Greater London Authority. Um, I was going to suggest to ask you to briefly introduce yourself, but also maybe you can indicate or describe what your relationship to adaptation is and what your relationship to the UKCR work and, and how you were involved. And in particular for, um, for, the, uh, for the others, then Kate, we already heard from you, Kate. But I think for all of you, maybe one message that you want all of us to remember when we go back home this afternoon, maybe that's also good from the start. That would set the scene from my perspective and it would also stimulate questions and in the meantime of course think about your questions and also online please use the slido to put your questions in slido um shall we go from right to left email thanks um hi thanks for having me i feel like i've emerged um i originally started working um with uh, colleagues on the program um, I'm, my background is a public health consultant, so I previously was running the um, the P Public Health England Extreme Events team, which is where I originally started working with the program. So leading on the response to extreme events and pulling through that program to focus more on adaptations and response with from a public health perspective. My role now, I work for the GLA and lead on public health aspects of planning, resilience and environment and with climate as the cross-cutting part of that. So 
my legs were kind of cut from underneath me with COVID midway through the program. So I, I basically caught up on everything yesterday, not everything. But um, in terms of the key message, um, probably it's um, at the end, I'd have another one. But for the moment, I think one of the so many brilliant um, thoughts came through yesterday uh, with such a dense program. But one of the things that I really felt was um, mentioned, I can't remember who said it, but the the message was to start with the decision. So we have a lot of evidence on risks, hazards, lesson impacts. That's okay. Uncertainty is something we need to be comfortable with when it comes to decision making. But actually, it's really important to know what the decision is because what the information that can be used to inform that will change depending on the decision. Um, so on a, a second message, focus on relationships. It's really important. So. Hello. Hi, everyone. Lovely to be here. Um, so I'm I'm based in the Sustainable City team at Bristol City Council and I lead the climate adaptation resilience work. Um, and in terms of my role um, and interface with this programme, um, we, were, we were lucky enough to um, get support and expertise through this programme, working with Victoria, who's in the audience from the Met Office, and Dr Charlotte Brown, um, who was at the Tyndall Centre at the time. So that project was all about um, tackling urban heat risks um, and it was because of the ability to localise data through UK Climate Local and through the creation of Heat Vulnerability Index that was a really important process for us um, getting our first picture of the kind of spatial distribution of um, heat risks in the city so that was kind of my interface with, with the programme and we'll probably pick up some of the points. Um, in terms of key messages I'd echo your, your point, but I think um, another strong message from yesterday is kind of like the, the crown, the ground truth thing and the portability of climate services. And of course, then that links into how you plug in that work and how it supports decision making, et cetera. Thanks very much. Um, hi, Dan McCartney. Um, I head up the DEFRA climate adaptation team. Uh, so my team, as, as we speak, are beavering away on the national adaptation program uh, uh, which we hope to uh, lay in Parliament before the summer. Um, so that's my uh, role. Uh, we've also published a consultation on the adaptation reporting power, which some of you may be aware of. If you're not, check it out and, and do do respond if you if you can. Um, it's an interesting question. What's the, the sort of key message? Or the, the, the sort of key takeaway? I guess I'd say, can we make this? simpler can we make things easier and not harder um, the complexity of the challenge on climate adaptation of the projections of the range of different measures risks um, is incredibly challenging for public authorities um, the interconnection between them um, is not as understood as it could be um, where your work your work going forward and, and by the way there's a huge uh, range of stuff that I'm only starting to get to know I'm relatively new to this subject started in September last year uh, it's fantastic um, but going forward if we can move towards more certainty even if we've got to manufacture it dare I say um, in order to uh, inform actions that's helpful I'll stop there but happy to talk more about that later Thanks. Okay, so my official job title is Knowledge Exchange Fellow in Floods and Society, which is very grand for a humble postdoc. Um, I've been involved in the UK CRP. I came to the town hall actually years ago and reported back to the team in Hull, which led to Risky Cities, which I've been involved in. My takeaway message would be something I'm always going on about. So Hull, for example, highly risky, second most at risk from flood place in the UK has a really low uptake of flood warnings. That's not because people in Hull don't care or are stupid or are lazy or are ill-informed. It's because they have other stuff going on. So people who don't engage in adaptation aren't engaging because they don't care or because they're not understanding it. They're not engaging because you haven't made it matter to them. We haven't made it easy for them to engage. So check that. Thank you very much. Making it simpler and easier to engage. Yeah, that's that's a really good recommendations. Um, for a change, I come to the room in a minute. For a change, I was going to take one of the online questions first. And 
the topic is actually the same question maybe has been asked yesterday. How do we scale up local activities to occur across the UK? But I would really like to hear your perspective on this as well, because it is so relevant, of course, the place-based aspects which you are emphasizing is important, but it immediately raises the question, how do we scale up? And for Kate in particular, there was the question about how these uh, arts and humanities work has led to new local action groups, which were not there before the project. Um, yeah. Yeah, you want to make a start? Yes, it has. Um, so we've worked, one of the things we've done is commission uh, local artists to respond to and engage with the archival work, the literary work, and some of the creative outputs. And in one of the evaluation sessions, we gathered the artists together. And within about half an hour, they were planning a five day festival and working out how they could get this funded by the Arts Council. And there could be water environment festivals all around the UK. So that rapidly grew into something that is way beyond the scope of what we ever imagined it to. So yes, it does. It's a bit like uh, Bill and Ted, if you ask them, they will come. It turns out people really like it. Um, yeah. Thanks. How do we how do we ramp up? I think it was the question locally. Um, so there's a there's a role for, for a variety of people here, I, I think. There's obviously a lot of work. I mean, I, I have this rare privilege of having worked on what some of you might remember, uh, the Nottingham Declaration, which was the first um, uh, kind of cross local government, if you like, agreement that brought mitigation and adaptation together. And at that time, the adaptation element of it was very, let's say, nascent and, and difficult to think about. It remains so, there has been a lot of movement forward, but it is not uniform. Um, so lots of work happening in various, and we've heard a bit about them, um, areas. Um, how do we get that to sort of, it, it sort of uh, kind of become more consistent and ramp up? There's clearly a role for government in, in a sense of, uh, uh, and working with the research community to provide additional certainty on what are the projections. Open CLIM, I think, and other um, uh, 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 outputs, I think, uh, and I don't know in detail, but I think will be really incredibly helpful for that local understanding of risk in order to inform action. We're really interested in, uh, in so in the adaptation reporting power consultation, we're exploring running a pilot for local authorities to um, uh, report. I'm interested in volunteers for that, um, to examine how that mechanism uh, of adaptation reporting could help. Uh, certainly not expecting that to be mandatory, uh, but for those local authorities that are uh, interested. Um, and we're also talking to the LGA about, um, you know, where and, and what, what do we need to provide more of? And when I say we, I don't just mean government. I mean, the LGA, ADEPT, other organisations, organisations rep representing combined authorities. You know, how can they or we collectively help provide a bit more certainty on that? There's obviously a load of funding questions that I'll dodge for now uh, associated with that. Um, but I think there's more that we can do collectively. I'll stop there. Thank you. I'm going to be greedy and pick three things related to that question. So I think there's something that came up really strongly yesterday again was about making sure that that kind of place based engagement and working with communities and neighbourhoods isn't an add on. It's about how you build on the existing and how you piggyback on what's going on. Obviously, obviously that's easier where there's already stuff going on in neighbourhoods, but that's not representative across the board. So I think it's kind of looking for those opportunities in your cities, in your towns, in your villages for building on what's already happening. And places like Bristol, we've got a very active, very well-informed community. So there's lots of opportunities there. I think something that's emerging for me in my work is is uniforming, unifying themes. So there's various things that, again, language might not um, be, um, might be too techy for certain environments, certain audiences, but I think the kind of the themes of health, the themes of nature-based solutions, kind of using the natural environment to help deliver um, climate resilience and adaptation measures is important. So it's using for those, using those opportunities and those channels and those groups. Um, and then something again that uh, I feel very acutely in my work and came up yesterday was kind of how you value stakeholder input. And some of that will need to be financial. You know, I kind of look around the room and there aren't many people from local government here. And it's it's kind of, you know, resources and capacity and funding is there. And I think it's um, that feedback 
with through engagement as well about going back to people and saying this is the result of your contribution and I think that's really important because people need to be motivated to come back again so that's that's my greedy three I think she's been reading my notes actually <laughs> yeah um, so I've written public um, sector engagement on all of my pages from yesterday and today I think that is where much of adaptation is going to happen well there is an issue of course with financing but one of the things we do have is a set of common levers which are relevant to all local government organizations and they do have budgets for housing for social care, for transport, and we need to mobilize them around health inequalities and adaptation because adaptation is a health and a health equity issue and challenge. Um, that is one of the key common threads that will help us to present this as an opportunity rather than a threat and to mobilize some of that public sector resource. And it also relates to how we mobilize private sector resource because they sit within communities. Local businesses are also concerned with the their local economy and their communities and they need to be mobilized around this as well. And a lot of this, it again, goes back to relationships, developing relationships you guys developing relationships with public sector colleagues, working with the local government and buying into the fact that they are concerned with their communities and they also act as a bridge to their communities and they're hugely mobilised around the climate agenda at the moment. And that's actually where there's a lot of dynamic activity and innovation happening now. Um, so amongst the opportunities that are out in local government to think about the planning system, to think about transport strategies, to think about the cycle for their policy making and their budgeting and to go to them regularly to ask them what are you thinking about what are the problems you face so you are thinking about how you frame your evidence to help them develop policies and their strategies and use that evidence to advocate within local government and central government in the same way because these are not these are not problems that are coming up at the last moment a policy opportunity might come up at the last moment but actually people are thinking about those cycles now so conversations that happen now might end up in DEFRA's policy it might take five years but that might be the way it starts Thank you very much, all of you. And what, what you said about linking to health, for me, that really resonates that adaptation action is not in isolation of everything else and all the other goals. So, um, okay, let's let's see, let's come to the room and see if there's questions here, here in the middle. Great, thank you. Um, yeah, I, get, I, I guess it's been partly answered. The, 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 one of the questions I was going to ask, so I might be greedy and ask like one and a half. So I, I think, um, Kate, you said at the beginning, I think it got touched on there about people have other things to think about. And, you know, I, I live in Morecambe. My wife's a counsellor there. You know, it's like one of the 10 de deprived um, uh, places in the country. And of course, you know, that, that makes it, it does make it complicated. But I guess linking it in with, with health does begin to partially answer that. So I guess that maybe if anyone wants to develop on that, and then my greedy second bit was um, a lot of things that I, I, I got involved with briefing um, climate juries. And I just wondered if the panel had any thoughts about whether they thought they were successful or whether they were a good way to engage communities. Any thoughts from anyone in the panel? <laughs> Giving each other the mic, that's always good. Um, I don't know much about climate juries. I do know that um, it's really hard to get city councils sometimes to listen. So one of the things we've struggled with is, I'm sure you are all exemplary in your listening, um, but in other places it doesn't always work that well. East Riding declared a, a climate emergency and then granted a massive fracking license the same week. So one of the things that we've been really wary of is over promising on what we can do. So we can we can make all this beautiful stuff and we can have an impact and we can we can show that emotion links to action. I've got the actual numbers for that. Um, but making that translate into policy on a local level and getting the city council to accept the people's view is not something that we can guarantee and that's I think that's probably a work in progress I I've been quite interested in the the idea from kind of public health of harm reduction if we see climate adaptation as harm reduction rather than kind of avoiding catastrophe I think that's got quite a lot of potential for getting buy-in from more uh, small c conservative local government administrations um. thanks Ema yeah, there's, um, there is something there about understanding what your audience wants to hear. Um, so some of it is about the risk, but increasingly we have evidence that um, people are not motivated by that. And it goes back to your 
um, insights on behavior change, which is absolutely true. Every single public health program we've ever delivered from obesity to antimicrobial resistance understands that people don't just change their behavior because they know something's wrong or difficult or you know, is going to accrue a benefit later. People need to understand, but they also need to be facilitated and they need to have the opportunity and the motivation. There's plenty of science that will tell us that. So that's another example of where you could reach out to your friendly behavioral science expert and ask them, how could you do your work better? How could you, like, how could you support decisions that are focused on behavior change? Because everything we're talking about today is behavior change, whether it's at the individual, the organizational or the national level. And all of that needs to be part thought through as an evidence process as well. I don't know if that's answered your question. <laughs> Are there any particular things that you feel we need to pick up uh, that we haven't already? Well, I think about, I don't know about that with climate juries, whether that's, if you've had any experience of that with climate juries, if you've had any experience of those with, with, with where you are. And, um, I personally don't, but I, I, people have mentioned in meetings about um, assemblies um, and I work in, we, my service is Sustainable City and then there's climate change team as well. So there's an awful lot of work going on there. Um, and so I unfortunately don't have any personal experience to contribute there. I don't know. If... I, I don't. I mean, I guess my only observation is, um, in a sense, getting there's a real awareness issue, isn't there, in the general public about what is adaptation? I mean, across the piece um, uh, and, and that challenge. I mean, it's a piece uh, we did a piece of work we're hoping to uh, be able to uh, publish something about it. Um, which is a public dialogue on um, uh, public awareness of uh, climate change and the adaptation element of it. Um, and it won't, I don't surprise anyone in the room uh, to know that the awareness levels are incredibly low. There are, there's some level of anger about not knowing about that from those that you confront with the information. Um, there's a lot more to do in that space in order that people can drive that forward but it comes back to my point I don't want to oversimplify but make it easy you've got to kind of explain this in a way that people understand and, and probably step back from all of the, the range of projections sometimes and say it in clear terms so that people understand and that's true for policy makers too. Can I, Thanks yes Emma please. Oh sorry. <laughs> and to, from, a, from a health perspective as well, it's evident that there is an increasing burden of mental health concern, driven by climate anxiety, particularly amongst um, young people, young adults who are far more acutely aware of what they're, they're looking down the barrel of. And so when we communicate risk, we need to be really careful that we're communicating it along with a solution that somebody else is going to manage for them. Just, um, I just wanted to put that out there because we're increasingly seeing it across um, the work I'm doing from a local government perspective, but also in my public health role. Thanks. Can I just add a little bit to that? Um, I mean, the, the two things, the mental health, what we have in Bristol is a quality of life survey. So there's a whole load of indicators that um, people give feedback on in terms of satisfaction with neighbours, neighbourhoods, etc. And what we've had in there for, I think, it'd be the third year, the reports this year is... Um, Three, three questions that I got in there. One was about the kind of climate anxieties. One was about, um, have you experienced overheating in your home over the last 12 months? And one was about local floods. Um, and something I we found from, you know, it's, it's a small data, you know, it's, it's only three, three years worth, but there was a definite kind of um, feeling that the kind of younger generations were reporting higher um, numbers for the, the kind of men mental health side of things. Um, and so there was another point you were... Yeah, there was a train of, train of thoughts gone, but I think it, it was that kind of, um, you know, there's so many different sources you can get in terms of building up that that picture and how you engage with people. That was the other thing, I think, from the arts and humanities based side of stuff. I think the kind of story of change is really important, how you actually engage people yeah. um, and bring them along the way. And I think something that's come up a lot, a lot and we've talked about urban heat risks is you've got data at this spatial scale, but how do you also plug in and have blended data on people's lived experiences? Yeah, thank you very much. That links a little bit to the top question here online, which is uh, what what works and what doesn't work. So, what what is the or how do you measure success of adaptation measures? And the the question actually is is a bit more specific, but I think that's the general background. The question is how do we measure the uptake of adaptation, such as reduction of energy and water consumption at local, regional, and national level? How do we measure success of adaptation? Any views and anything we could do? 
in that. Well, you're keen to ask that. <laughs> Happy to have a go. Um, it's difficult, isn't it? And, and, you know, defining what the actual outcome is in its own right is difficult. And, if you wanted to make things simpler. It, yes, indeed. Um, it's incredibly difficult. Um, I mean, I, I can only sort of reflect on the, the difficulty plus talk about how we uh, uh, proposing to sort of address it, I guess. Um, so we have CCRA um, that uh, will, rather we have the NAT and we will uh, outline an intention, or at least we hope to, to uh, do some work on monitoring and evaluation um, uh, and establish a framework there. Uh, that will be a piece of work that we hope to do, subject to ministers' views uh, in the period post the summer. Um, it's a very detailed piece of work um, where we can add any material in against the, the overview of response to risks in the NAP itself, we will do. It's, again, difficult. Um, but there is a piece of work to really start to address that because it's very difficult to move it forward unless you can actually measure uh, where you're aiming to get to. There's something about vision and something about kind of end destination overall there that I think we very much address, uh, understand and, and think we need to address. We'll see where we get to on the NAP, but there's future work there too. I mean, yesterday we talked a lot about metrics. We've also talked about indicators today, and we've also talked about the complexity and the, the sheer volume of stuff and trying to navigate that. And I think there's a really important piece that helps distill the kind of range of metrics for different things out there and the, and the relative benefits of using certain data to track progress and the complexity that's involved in actually gathering that information because, you know, often you need to have systems set up to actually gather that information it's not something that's ready off the shelf so i think there's all these different layers in actually actually being able to express how you're going to capture it how you're going to collect the data the different quality issues you have with all of it and how you bring it bring it together so i think any any support on that would be amazing thanks i, I do think that the difficulty in nailing down adaptation in terms of metrics that people can then justify an investment in has been one of the main barriers. And I think there is, it's the, the issue goes wider and it's, it's a more of an ideological view that the precision is what matters when actually decisions are made in, in lots of cases where there's very, very little precision. Actually, when you look at it in more detail, it's been quite fabricated. And I think we need to accept that the system complexity here requires us to move away from an expectation that we're going to have really precise data and to not expect people to be held to that. For example, if you look at the evaluation of the heatwave plan for England, you couldn't possibly, from an epidemiological point of view, expect us to shift the heat mortality curves with a plan that's an alerting system without broad scale adaptation on the ground as well. And, and at the same time, when your population vulnerability is increasing, temperatures are not the only thing that's changing in that background. So we, we need to make sure that we don't make a rod for our own backs and whatever indicators are decided upon, they should include things like governance. What does the governance around the financing and the, the roles and responsibility around adaptation, that's a really good indicator of whether we're progressing this rather than trying to look at mortality or, you know, I don't know what else. But, you know, these hard indicators are not necessarily where we're going to see change happening. And they won't tell us that we've made any progress because it's a system. Just quickly add and then pass it over. I think, yes, that kind of process-based indicator, no, <laughs> process-based indicator. And that's, you know, I, I go back to the days of National Indicator 188. And that was all about process and steps for showing that you're preparing to for climate change at a city level. So I think it is that mix of things. And yes, clearly decisions are made in an imperfect environment. You've, you've got you've got pressure, you've got urgency, you've got all sorts of things that are influencing your decisions and competing pressures. So I think it's kind of doing things on a case-by-case -case basis. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks very much. Another question from the room. Yes, there is one in the back here and then from to the front, Jason. Hello, um, so I'm Sarah Froome from NERC, um, and I have been working closely with a public dialogue um, workshop. Um, it came to me that I think a lot of work is going to be done at the educational level of children, um, and perhaps quite a lot of the arts-based um, work could focus with schools, because worryingly enough, young people in the survey 
didn't actually know what coastal erosion or biodiversity actually meant. So I think a lot of work is going to be done at a grassroot level. Um, I don't know about you, but I think perhaps more um, place-based work perhaps should be in schools as well. Oh, and worryingly enough, one of the communities that was saying they didn't understand those terms was a coastal community. Thanks. Really good question. Any one wants to reply? Wait. I can have an opinion about that. Um, what age were the young children, young people that you were? They were between 18 and 20. So oh, that is man. really, really worrying in my opinion. That is bad. Um, I think it's probably inevitable in a school system that at the age of 14 pushes you to being a science person or an arts and humanities person. So if you haven't done, I didn't do GCSE, GCSE geography because I was too busy doing history and I had to pick one. So in a system that pushes people to making a decision at a very tender age, it's inevitable that you're going to miss out. A lot of people are going to miss out on what I think is it's a kind of fundamental right to have that knowledge about the world around them. Um, one of these, I do a lot of uh, play-based, participatory, hands-on stuff. And one of my frustrations is that people always assume that I love working with children because I do play and games. I hate it. <laughs> I like, I think, yes, it, yes, it is a good way of int int introducing ideas, but actually there is real value in getting adults sitting around a table. As we found for those people who were brave enough to come to the workshop that I run in Hull, there's real value in getting adults playfully engaging around a table, especially when they're learning something they've never done before for generating new conversations. Thanks. Um... So education is really important, makes me immediately remind, and there, is, there are some education aspects in, in UKCR built in, but it's also going forward, something definitely to take on board all the time. Um, Jason, and then I'll go probably to one of the almost final questions online. Can I check in the meantime, uh, Suraj, how much, when do you want to, five minutes, okay? Yeah, great, thank you. Jason. Thank, thank you. Um, so, to me, sometimes the climate debate and the adaptation debate can become very one-dimensional. Um, are we bringing enough into the debate issues like um, other aspects of development, co-benefits um, of adaptation and mitigation, and also the trade-offs between alternative uh, adaptations and mitigations? And if we're not bringing it in enough, how do we change that on a community level and on a, a local and national policy level? Who wants to go first? <laughs> I mean, I, I'm happy to have a go. I mean, I, I, how do we do that? I mean, I'd go back to starting to bring a debate to pass here. I just don't think the awareness, uh, and I, I don't want to do any disrespect to colleagues in government or other parts of public service, um, but I think the awareness of, implications of climate adaptation and the cross connections involved in it are 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 on a journey and aren't I you know where they ideally would be so there's a, a a huge job there to bring that level up and that's just government uh, if you think about the wider society business and um, we heard earlier about some sort of bigger business and sort of insurance sector and I think that's sort of starting to drive itself um, small business, I think there's quite a lot there to do um, to, to sort of raise that awareness. And, and I think that is, is perhaps how you drive your thinking. People don't really think of climate change adaptation. They might think about, you know, my office was very hot, you know, in the summer or I was working at home and I, you know, didn't want to open the window because actually it was even hotter. Um, but are they making the connection with what that actually means and how can we help them to do that? Um, I think there's a there's a job for for lots of us, the research community, government, to widen that out, subject to how ministers want to sort of think about it. Um, it's a low base. I think that's how you start to bring that about. If that's not too much of a dodged answer, I don't know if this answers the question or partially answers the question. But I, in Bristol, we declared both a climate and an ecological emergency. So you have kind of one city plan for both of them and then the work that kind of cascades from that and 
in our service, there's, there's the Climate and Ecological Emergency Programme and some of the work that I do sits under that. And I think it's that kind of joining together. Um, I think, you know, the expectations for how much joining up is the, is the new NAP going to do in terms of the upstream change and then stuff happens as a consequence of that. Um, and we are having those discussions about an integrated approach. You know, how does, and I'm saying actually delivering on that, there's, there's, there's the complexity of it, but um, um, how does net zero link to building in climate resilience? And then, oh, what about nature recovery? And it's it's so many things you, you, you don't keep coming back and change things. You might have one or a handful number of interventions, whether it's retrofit or infrastructure. And I think it's just how you build in that kind of integrated future proofing into the kind of work that we do. Thanks very much. So it's a bit related to the uh, the, the final question from online, um, which is the about siloed uh, working and siloed funding. And I think yesterday and also this morning, a lot of times uh, the uh, characteristics of UK climate resilience were mentioned as working across cross di disciplinary dis different disciplines, um, working all the way from with policymakers, practitioners, uh, all other stakeholders, and scientists. And that is really good. And I think. The question is uh, a bit of it, how can we keep that momentum more or less? But Liz Sharp online is asking, the, uh, phrasing the question a bit different. Um, how can government support adaptation that both adapts and delivers other benefits? So um, away from siloed, siloed working. Any views from anyone in the panel? <laughs> There's something there about opportunities. Uh, how do we avoid siloed working to, to achieve opportunities? I think there is siloed working. I think in terms of how we cut up the current risk assessment, you know, vertically, 61 risks, um, that creates siloed thinking. Uh, there is an opportunity to get better at the join up between risks. Um, this probably works against the simplicity. Um, but how we do that, I think, is something that we're developing. I think um, Climate Change Committee um, can help, CCRA4 can help uh, there in order to achieve the, the sort of opportunity. I mean, I guess opportunities can be looked at in various ways, can't it? You know, the opportunity of doing this better or the opportunity that actual, actual climate change brings and, you know, the CCRA that we currently have identifies a few opportunities there. They're quite difficult to achieve, you know, opportunities around sort of crops you might grow or roots that you might, trans, you know, transcend. Arctic regions with ships, etc. I think they're quite difficult to achieve. Um, I think there's something though about the opportunities of just getting better at the connections between those risks, I guess would be my sort of Thank last answer. Thank you. One of the other panel members wants to come in. Yes, Ima. I think there is a long way to go. Um, and I think it's going to take some time to get there, um, having worked both at national, regional and local level. Um, there are difficulties with siloed working everywhere you go because people are busy and know what they know and often feel, um, some people feel more comfortable moving across and talking to people, others less so. Um, I think one of the common threads, though, is to find a, a the commonality for me has always been health, which is both hard and easy in the sense because everyone's brought up to that. They're like, yes, health inequalities. We agree with reducing those and doing things that improve health. But the complexity of the system is what it is. And the funding difficulties are there and won't be resolved anytime soon. So I think it, at the moment, it's easier to take the conversation where you need it to be. So for me, that means talking to the housing team about what climate mitigation and adaptation means for them the planners what climate adaptation and mitigation means for them with health inequalities at the core of those conversations so i think there is going to have to be quite a bit of reframing of what it is you want to achieve around what it is they need to achieve and take it from there because that's the only way we have to go at the moment it will get better but at the moment like, we can't wait so i think we just have to be a bit more ambitious in making those connections and you know, building on what's already there Okay, great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any one of the panel members, a very final comment. Kate, please go ahead. Yes. Yeah. 
Okay, so this is kind of a challenge for all the people who do the humanities and social science work. Actually, it's incumbent upon uh, uh, on us to find ways that explain how the work we do does both of those things. I do quite a lot of work on social value evaluation, and there are ways within that of demonstrating that there is a, a kind of financial proxy benefit. For example, if you reconnect a catchment so that you've got sediment connectivity, that delivers hydrological benefits, it delivers flood risk benefits, but it also delivers social value benefits. And if you look at those in the right way, then you can make a really compelling case to have adaptation that both delivers those solutions and actually is a benefit to the agencies who are trying to make things better. Okay, great. Thank you very much. I suggest with that we close the session and I would like to thank the panelists one more time. And also thanks everyone online. And can I just check questions that have been asked online? Are there somewhere available after the meeting as well? Um, great. Yeah, that is good because I think it would be good to reply to some of those as well afterwards. Thanks. Thank you very much. And we're moving on to Mr. Raj, you're going to lead the chair the next session. Yeah. Thank, thanks very much, Arvid, for, for chairing. So we're now moving on to the final uh, panel session of the day. Uh, and uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Mark Harrison, who's the head of applied uh, U U applied uh, UK applied science at the Met Office, and has been working with various colleagues in in uh, the insight paper about what we've learned about climate services. So I'll hand over to you, Mark, and then we'll we'll join a, a panel shortly. Super, thanks, Siraj. Okay, so um, my involvement with UKCR was as uh, work package lead for two of the work packages that the Met Office run. Work package three was looking at uh, developing a number of pilot climate services and work package four was looking at how we go about embedding those. So uh, on the metaphor side of the program, we had 11 projects over the duration of UKCR and there's a whole heap more on the UKRI side. So last year we were challenged with writing some insight papers and very much drawing upon three insight papers uh, for content um, for this presentation. So. We have Rachel in the audience and Craig, who wrote the first one about decision support tools. Myself and Caitlin at the back wrote climate services inside our school. And finally, Nicola Golding, who's joining virtually, wrote the co-production one all by herself. So very much drawing on those. I've come up with, um, this is the only slide, by the way, so um, I thought you'd had enough of slides by now. So uh, the four main themes that stuck out for me. I'm going to start at the top right and I'm going to work through them in turn in a clockwise fashion. So I think this was touched upon yesterday at the very start and I think Richard, um, Betts and Jason kind of commented on it slightly earlier. That's one of the joys of going last, I guess. And that was one of the benefits was program structure, the fact that it was co-delivered by the Met Office and UKRI. I think having one single joint science plan joint steering group right up at the top really helps and then that that sort of like linkage all the way down in terms of supporting projects on both sides really helped. Um, I should also add there um, private sector I think again Jason mentioned this earlier um, it was great to be able to draw upon skills and expertise in the private sector and um, that we don't necessarily have ourselves so we heard yesterday from Murray Dale about the standards work that they did looking at develop or co-producing a standard for climate services. We don't have those skills or expertise as in Met Office and it was great to be able to pull in that from the private sector. Next up, the programme was obviously four years or so. So over the duration of the programme, we had the opportunity to draw in new projects as we learned more. So as Victoria talked about yesterday with the city packs, you know, we started off just talking with Bristol, but then it moved on to more and more cities. So it became apparent, you know, how do we maintain this focus on co-development that is right at the heart of best practice with climate service development and this idea of upscaling? How do we go from producing information from three cities to 30 cities to 300 local authorities? So again, we were able to spin up a project looking very much at upscaling. And there's a paper published on this just last month 
And this week, actually, we've just put a really useful, hopefully really useful toolkit online. So please check out the UK Climate Resilience website for that, that toolkit. We'd really be keen to get your feedback on that. Uh, and the final graphic there is the project managers and program managers in the room here, and they'll tell you that a program um, should deliver greater than the sum of its constituent parts. So um, I think it was Simon Brown first up yesterday uh, talked about some of the very um, some of the analysis of the very high resolution climate models. It was great that we would be able to pull that work through from one work package to another. And similarly, um, when it came to the upscaling work, it was great that we were able to bounce some ideas off uh, some of the other projects um, that were both on the Met Office side and also the E-Flag project. I'd like to um, shout out to Chris Council at HR Wallingford who helped with the development of that, that line of work. So it's great to be able to pull on other expertise. So that's the programme structure uh, box. Moving on to the funding one. Um, I believe that um, with climate services, if we're going to make a real difference, we need to start you know, reaching out to those sectors and those industries that we don't typically engage with. Um, and the SPF funding really helped us kind of lift the lid on new markets. So again, thinking about the urban climate service work, that wasn't necessarily something as an organisation we'd have chosen to do. But with the SPF funding, it meant that we had the time and the space to explore that market, what their needs were. And I think over the course of the last three or four years, we've really um, made great inroads there. Similarly, yesterday, the chap talking about Church of England, that was just another opportunity to kind of delve into new markets and so on. A uh, second point on the funding, um, I think, you know, my interest is very much in sort of like the application end, the climate service development bits, but we need to bear in mind that this is absolutely built on the underpinning climate science. So when it comes to services, we need that underpinning climate space as upon everything that we then work. And finally, on the funding side, having been unusually positive and supportive of something in terms of the pro program structure, there is, there's just a sort of like nagging learning in that typically, uh, as fine upstanding citizens, we need to demonstrate value for money to the UK taxpayer. And that potentially means that we're, we kind of limit our ambition slightly in terms of the calls that we put out. You know, we, we ask for things like benefits, um, people to, to describe what they plan on doing in terms of a Gantt chart and risks and so on, which meant that some of the calls were drawing upon pre-existing knowledge of sectors. So the E-Flag projects, for example, they absolutely knew the needs of their sector. So to use a term that I know Jason doesn't like, in our technology area, we talk, they, they tend to work in a more agile fashion. So they talk about things like having a time box sprint at the start to truly understand what they're going to do for the rest of the project. So I think one learning for me is how, how would we go about uh, making sure that we have that space at the start of a project to ensure that it, we really are getting, we're going along the right lines to developing stuff that users actually need and want. Okay, so moving on to co-development, um, I should declare that I'm, I'm an introverted physical science who ditched art and history at the age of 14, blame the Scottish education system. So I, I personally find some of the arts and humanities stuff really challenging, but um, I think to be challenged is actually not a bad thing. Um, and um, I think there's certain amounts we can learn from the things that we've um, done during UKCR. Um, Victoria Ramsey's in the audience. I don't think you mentioned this massively yesterday, but um, one of the things Victoria did was um, work with the embedded researchers to hold a walking workshop in Belfast that was all about place-based discussions and this sort of thing that we've just heard about in the previous discussion session. So um, that really helped ground some of the sort of like big picture climate services stuff in the sort of like reality of that, that city. So I'm really keen that we kind of learn from some of this arts-based stuff and think what we could kind of build into our, our traditional ways of working. Uh, next up, um, I think Rachel and Craig's paper kind of majored on this, and that was like the difference between user-focused co-development of climate services versus capability-focused um, um, co-development. So, so that there are a number of 
points that Rachel and Craig make in their insight article, so please dig into that. But this is just a reflection of the fact that different users are at different stages of their adaptation journey, and we need to kind of be, be mindful of that. And whichever approach we take, whether it's a capability first or user first, we need to be mindful of the pros and cons and think about the appropriate time to bring users into the conversation. Incentivization. So I've actually written this down because I'll probably forget it. But this is something that Nicola Golding mentioned a little while ago, and I, I kind of took it to heart somewhat. I think there are a number of different ways of defining co-production, but what Nicola said was co-production is at its best an equitable balance of power where people with different skill sets, knowledges, and perspectives work together to reach a common goal. So how does that work then? Most of our funding goes to climate service providers, um, whether or not it is through UKCR or other means. So, so whilst we recognise the values that, value that users bring, we don't necessarily actually compensate for that or include them in projects. And so maybe we should actually specifically include that in terms of future calls. Having, having done some work in developing countries overseas, I know that most users there um, will only turn up to any sort of workshop if they're actually paid for it. So um, how do we recognize the value that users bring to projects if we are truly um, in favor of co-development? Regulation might be a bit of a, a, a stick rather than a carrot, but it's something worth, worth pondering on, I think. Okay, moving into uh, the home straight now. So most climate service providers are um, very much grounded in sort of like the research or the academic sphere where the currency of um, success is academic papers. And I think during UKCR, we've got a fair stack of papers that we published over the last few years. But in terms of climate services, I think, you know, the, the sort of outputs and the success criteria are probably broader. So it might be reports, it might be data sets, um, it might be infographics, it might be things like understanding user needs better, it might be um, developing deeper relationships, etc. But it's certainly broader than just papers. Building, moving on from that, how do we develop people with the skills and interests to have that wider perspective? Um, so things like, obviously, climate science, science, analysis, all that kind of stuff is, is paramount, but how do we how we, do we educate people in terms of user engagement, um, requirements gathering, um, user experience, products, um, um, service development, etc. All these are additional aspects that people don't necessarily have to have deep expertise in, but certainly awareness of, etc. And finally, um, the last point is about building the community. Um, I said to Siraj to embarrass him now, but I think Siraj and Kate have done a great job over the last four years in terms of building the UK climate resilience community through things like this event, the Hull event. But obviously we've had COVID that kind of messed everything up. So having having the online seminars that include users, I think is is um, a great thing to have done. The virtual forums, um, the newsletters, all that has really um, helped develop the climate um, resilience community. Um, which is great, but you also need to be mindful that um, we'll hopefully take some of this forward through the National Framework for Climate Services, but I think we need to be mindful of the fact that this needs to go beyond just the research community. It needs to include users such as uh, Lucy and others such that you know we actually um, go some way to actually making this a uh, more resilient future for the UK. With that, I'm gonna stop. Thank you, Suraj. Thank you very much for, for that intervention and your kind words. Mark, can I invite all the panelists to come up, please? So uh, we've got uh, Natalie Gareth from the Met Office. We have Katie Peet, who's the head of uh, adaptation science at DEFRA. Uh, Caitlin Douglas was a researcher at King's College London and an embedded researcher. Uh, and is now in the CTC and uh, Murray Dale, Technical Director at JBA Consulting. Uh, so I think probably I'll, I'll kickstart with, uh, I mean, you know, could you say a little bit about, yeah, your involvement in, in UKCR and, and, you know, what, what's your key reflection of the last, uh, what is it, 36 hours of, uh, of, of conference? Uh, and maybe, do you want to start with Natalie, maybe? Sorry, there's a mic there, uh, Caitlin, if you can. 
start from uh, from from there to here. This one's working. Yeah. Thanks. There's been a remarkable um, array of information the last two days. It's been quite overwhelming. I really, really enjoyed the um, interventions with the arts and humanities. I think there's an awful lot that we can learn from that within climate services. Obviously, from my perspective with the UK National Framework for Climate Services, I've got one perspective, but moving forward, it'd be really great to see more, um, yeah, more interaction with the arts and humanities within the climate services space, I think. Thanks. Um, I guess I'm coming at this from uh, being at DEFRA and looking at how we've got to the end or we're getting to the end of a, a statutory cycle with the third CCRA and the third NAP um, and moving into the fourth cycle um, and coming to the end of a UKRI funded programme and thinking about where we go next. Um, and I am reflecting on uh, how this, the um, community around climate services has developed and how the community around standards has developed and thinking about, okay, how can we mainstream that into, into the next cycle of what we do in government? Because I think what we all appreciate is that, you know, f three to five years is actually quite a long time. And um, uh, looking at the rate of change that we're seeing and the rate of sort of onset of certain climate impacts that we're seeing, we, we don't necessarily have another cycle to, to test theory. We've got to get this stuff done now. Um, but yeah, I've, I think there's an awful lot of good work coming out that we're really keen to get into actual operational work now. Thanks. I've been really impressed with the, I think there's been like a real step change in the knowledge and that's really been evident today or yesterday in particular. Uh, but I feel like now we've sort of We've got really good knowledge. We've got to focus now on that sort of facilitation gap, sort of making it easy and simple for everyone to use. Um, for me, um, it's probably the breadth of activities that have been undertaken uh, over the last few years and the fact that each of those are actually required in order to deliver what is needed or what is asked. So thinking back, you know, quantification of the hazard, um, Simon and others talked about, and then Laura talking about, you know, moving to risk, the SSPs, the standards work. There's so much there that needs to be done and or could be done. And I think for me, going forward, we need to kind of galvanize all this good stuff and focus on what the key questions are and how we can come together as a community to address those key questions. Thank you. Um, I've been involved in four of the UKCR projects in the last three, four years um, in standards, the yeah, standards area, um, in the needs for UK climate information and um, in future drainage, which was mentioned earlier this morning. Um, I think the reflections I've got on the programme and the, and the event today and tomorrow may be summarised in two words, um, users and decisions. So we, we heard this morning about start with the decision. This one view from people. I certainly support that, but I'd also say it's not just one decision. One water utility probably has 5,000 decisions to make related to climate projections and data. So it comes back to this engagement with the user. So my takeaway really is for the future of this type of research, how do we get that user engagement and get the users actually to drive the research. Thanks. I'd, I'd love to take some questions from the floor for the panelists. Yes, way at the back, Xiang Fu, Lu, and, and, and yeah, in the live stream, feel free to put your questions uh, through the live stream Slido as well. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you to all for the um, extremely insightful uh, remarks from the panelists and the presentations on the paper. Um, so my um, comment is really, how do we go probably a bit more granular um, when we talk about the climate services? Um, 
in terms of supporting adaptation decision making and risk management, essentially. So they are all very context specific. Uh, but um, in, in spite of that, can we actually go into, let's say, sectors? What are the sort of decisions, uh, adaptation decisions are involved in different sector contexts? And what kind of um, uh, the the um, the type of decisions or the context again is either to support the engineering climate climate resilient engineering design or is either to make a long term development plan at national level or at a regional level um, or is it just you know to support a business strategy. Um, you know, whether it's energy sector or water uh, utility. So these are all very, very um, diverse uh, sort of contexts. Can we actually start to categorize these different decision contexts and then catalog what is the need for climate services? And where we are, are we uh, able to um, certify to what extent this kind of needs? And where do we need to do more work? So I think we need to uh, maybe go a step further uh, to really uh, link it. And another thing about um, engage users, or we don't want to make a very clear distinction, is always sometimes blurred user and the provider in this space. But uh, we, we talk about the medical uh, and analogy, I would say. So when we're trying to bring the new medicine to the market, we always uh, conduct huge sort of clinical trials, uh, engaging the, you know, the potential patients who are going to use this. So I think we probably need to do a similar kind of thing in terms of uh, climate service development. Um, and, and that's, I think, the way we can really make a good progress. Thank you. Th thanks, Yingfu. Good. We, we've done a bit of research in this space, particularly for, 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 from you, Murray. Do you want to have a first go at, uh, at this comment? Okay, well, thank you. Um, the linking in with the, the question I hear, I think I appreciate it's it, we don't, you know, users doesn't really mean much to everybody, but users, it's talking about users of climate services. Maybe another way of talking about this is beneficiaries, those who are benefiting and becoming more resilient whether it's the, the community who are at risk of flooding in Hull or to um, the water company, Yorkshire Water, that covers that area or, or whoever, um, those are beneficiaries of the, of the services and the information. So we're trying to make the UK more resilient to the, the challenges we're facing. If we don't want to call them users, we can call them beneficiaries. But in, at some form or other, part of the issue is this term climate services I think we talked about this yesterday that it's not a well understood term so if people don't know what a climate service is that in fact many people have been using them for 20 years because UK SIP 02 was a climate service um, so we've we've got climate services around but if we're going to keep using that term and then going on about how we use and uh, provide services we've got to kind of get that term very well understood by all the people that that are benefiting. I'll stop there. Do you want to say something here, Mark? Because I think the you know the, the the work you guys have done on upscaling is very relevant to Xiang Fu's question about you know a lot of this is context specific. There's very specific decisions, but how do you then go from that one one or two contexts to to a broader yeah landscape? I think there's um, a real challenge, to be honest. Um, the information that we've provided on upscaling through this project will hopefully help provide some useful tips. I think as we heard from a, an earlier discussion session, you know, there are some commonalities potentially across different users. Um, I, th I think people are talking about transport and buildings and so on. I think we do need to kind of try to um, pull together similar users and um, think how best to meet their needs. I mean, with the urban one, we started very much by building awareness and it's through understanding more about people's needs that you're able to start delivering services to that. So a con concept that Murray quite often talks about is knowledge translators, and I think they have a key role to play in this sort of space too. Yeah, so I've been thinking about that question about scaling and sort of what I'm leaning towards um, is, is regulation kind of the key to that? 
because it kind of will drive widespread user need and then provides kind of a standardization of demand. So whether that's sort of a key thing that could help with this uh, upscaling problem. Um, yeah, I was, I was going to go back to the point around users and, and how do we define them and um, it's come up before today, users are not a homogenous group um, and I think Murray's framing of decisions is perhaps sometimes more helpful in terms of trying to work out how we provide a service for them um, and just I guess to be very blunt about it, you know, you might you might have someone that needs a design standard or you might have someone that needs to make a policy, policy decision about whether or not they press go on a particular policy mechanism. Um, and the granularity of information to, to do that is is very different. Um, and I think that's what needs to be baked into research at the, at the start of the process. So rather than thinking, okay, well, what, what insights does this give us into future climate? Thinking about actually what decisions are people trying to take and how can we link the research very clearly to that sort of outcome and impact. I think a lot of what you've described was around kind of market analysis and seeing where the opportunities are within the space. We've spoken a lot about the Wild West. What are we doing to bring in the cowboys? I mean, it, people in this room might consider themselves sheriffs, if you'll allow me to belabor that analogy. But if we're going to use regulation as a stick to compel providers to deliver a service of a certain quality, what, what's the other sort of incentive? Are we going to reach out to them? How do the users choose who to go to? Have we investigated that? What are the factors they consider? Do they think about climate or do they think about adaptation or do they think about risk in general? I think there's a lot of opportunity in that space to understand why it is people choose certain providers who may not provide them with a service that actually delivers the benefit they're looking for. There's a question at the back, Anna. Great, thank you. Um, I have a concern that we, we collectively, myself included, have made climate adaptation the domain of an intellectual elite um, and there's huge amounts of incredible research and I don't mean to devalue that I think that's crucial but there's this sense of urgency of Katie I think spoke really well about the fact that we don't have more cycles like now is the moment that we need to upscale adaptation progress and impact across the UK and what collective if we do more of the same we'll get more of the same so I think there's a fun need to rethink how do we engage and involve senior leaders and wider society in this collective societal challenge of adapting to climate change. I think that needs to be reflected in the way that future research is funded. It's not all the responsibility of research, but how do we build on the excellent work that we've seen here and actually really help contribute effectively to the kind of step change that we need? And I'd be really interested in any views on that. Thank you. Okay. Does anyone want to have a go at that? I mean, I think it connects a little bit with with what Dan was talking about earlier about, you know, simple messages to to communicate the urgency of and and the need to adapt. But if you want to kickstart, I I completely agree. And obviously, from my perspective, I'm hopeful that the UK national framework for climate services could be a potential vehicle to enable that to happen. Um, and we all have a part to play in this. It's not like it's going to be one person's individual responsibility to. So we, we, we can all be advocates um, and we all have a voice that we can use. And I'd be interested to know what your perspective might be on that one. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I mean, I think there is, I guess, as a call to be ready when you're asked. Um, I suppose from my perspective within government and, and touching on what, what Dan raised in the earlier session, um, awareness of climate information is sometimes not that great um, amongst other areas, but actually actually the experience of climate impacts is increasingly growing and the pressures on that the people's abilities to deliver the jobs that they're supposed to deliver and the the objectives they're supposed to deliver is growing so the ask is increasing um, and i think one of the things that we've been doing through the, the development of the third national adaptation program is really trying to reflect on where climate information is hitting and where climate information is not hitting well in terms of trying to develop that forward look and an actual program of actual adaptation interventions. Um, so I do feel we're getting to a place where we can think about, you know, where future research can support this. But um, in terms of how we do that in a structured way, and we've talked about co-development, we've talked about who, you know, who's who's framing the research. I I don't necessarily think it's us going out and trying to, to describe a research program and then sell that to users. 
I, I think they're going to have to tell us what it is um, and we're going to have to work really hard and really quickly to enable them to do that. Uh, from researchers context, yeah, I think it's all about the funding call and having users built in from the start and also thinking about having sort of, yeah, the metrics of success for getting that funding related to usability and usefulness to the user rather than the traditional kind of journal articles or the standard metrics of success. So I think just taking a very different approach and all dread by, led by making it useful and usable to the user. Ditto. <laughs> And, and ditto from me, but I wouldn't mind having a go answering a couple of those questions, Suraj. Do you want to? You can pick one if you want. There well, you go. I, go I on. felt that um, I know number one is upvoted, but numbers two and three combine in a way for me. Number two, what if the needs decisions are unknown to all? A great question. I would say, in that case, do you need a climate service? Um, why why build a climate service if you don't know what it's being used for? Or, or who's going to use it and how? And um, does the panel have guidance on how to approach co-developing climate services? There's one example uh, of future drainage led by Haley Fowler. I don't know if Haley's here, but um, this was an example where we brought in all the water companies, the Environment Agency, National Resources Wales, SEPA, into a room to discuss the what the outputs of that climate service should look like at the outset so before we started doing the work then part way through we asked them some questions about what do you think about these options got some advice back then at the end we produced some guidance which has been up taken and been made useful and has been taken up um, by by SEPA and the Environment Agency in their in their guidance so there are ways of doing it I mean that was relatively easy in the sense that the water industry uh, in that particular project are were primed and ready to to act as co-developers co-designers of that service but um it, there's lots of ways of doing it it's not always easy but i think one has to ask yourself a, the question that if if you don't understand what the decision or the user need is is it do you need a service from the from the outset there's no point second guessing what people want and need go and ask them i'd say Anyway, sorry, that's a bit eruptive. <laughs> no, thanks, thanks. I, I mean, maybe you could pass the mic to 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 Mark because I was going to ask, you know, that that exact, you know, the sorry, which question is it? Um, the the guidance, the elements of the guidance around co-producing because there, there there's one paper uh, on co-production that Nicola led, and and I I wonder whether you feel we now have, you know, based on the on on all the you know, in a sense, prototype development of climate services the program has done. I mean, in a sense, it goes back to Yang Fu's question. We, we have a bit of a niche, right? I mean, a little bit of an ecosystem going. I mean, it, it's small in, in incipient maybe. And obviously then, I mean, maybe I'm connecting this a bit to Svenja's talk as well. I mean, and what Jim was commenting earlier. I mean, there's also a huge amount of private climate service providers now in the scene since the program started who are out there as well. So, so it's actually you know, in a sense exploded because of TCFD and, and many other requirements, you know, climate emergencies and so on. So um, I just wondered whether, yeah, we now have good guidance on, on co-development of climate services. So I think it's fair to say that we've tried many different approaches and some approaches have possibly been more successful than others. Um, I agree with Murray that co-design involving users throughout um, is the way forward. Um, I alluded to something that Rachel picked up and with Craig in the paper about whether or not something was more of a user-led pro project or more of a capability-led project. I think there are subtleties on that side of things. You can cut it that way. You could also cut it in terms of mature sectors, like the water sector you're talking there, talking about there, versus sectors that are maybe somewhat further behind. Um, so with the urban folk, it was very much about understanding, building trust, building awareness with them. They do have needs, but they didn't necessarily know what they were. I recognise that if there's not a need, then there's not much point developing something for them. But the flip side is many of these instances, weather and climate is only one small component of their wider decisions. So understanding, spending time with them, building trust, all those things are, are, are kind of really important, actually. But I don't think there'll ever be a one-size-fits-all approach to co-development. 
and uh, I think we have learned a lot and encourage people to read Nicholas' paper. Yeah, just to echo Mark's point, I think there is no one way. You have one standard approach. It all depends on the project, who you're dealing with. So I think it's more about having a skill set for a team of people with a skill set to actually listen to the user, work with them, engage with them, and yeah, build trust and work with them to find a solution to the problem. Um, yeah, not much more to add to that. Um, completely agree with those reflections on on building the, the trust with the, with the customers um, right from the start. Um, agree, completely agree with Murray about future drainage in particular being a, a really nice, clear example of how that that co development worked from the outset. Um, and I think it's something that we're trying to do on the the fourth climate change risk assessment as well is is start start with risk owners um, and then think about the science afterwards. Yeah. I completely agree. I think it's worth acknowledging that building trust-based relationships takes a lot of time. And when you have projects that come to an end after a year or two, what happens to those relationships afterwards, especially when you're dealing with potential users or marginalized groups for whom engagement with these things represents a really large amount of effort? Do you just leave them afterwards? I think there's a it's almost incumbent upon us to make sure people continue to have that continuity afterwards. But how do you do that without funding? That's more of a challenge, I suppose, than an answer. Any more questions from the floor? If not, then I'm going to go for the most voted uh, question there to see if uh, you guys would like to take that up. I mean, again, it connects with trying to communicate adaptation, I guess, um, in simple terms, but also, yeah, a, a, amongst, I guess, the campaigning groups. Uh, would, does anyone, yeah, uh, want to have a go at that? I mean, how, how, how do we engage with, um, with, with, with campaign groups uh, to raise the adaptation agenda in public consciousness? Yeah. It's a shame Rich Betts has already left, because I know that he's been quite active in engaging. And some, some people who work for government have limited ability to do this within the role of the job as a civil servant and other people for instance rich who's got joint post and has academic freedom in order to sort of speak to these groups there's you can go to festivals as he does like a, i'm just basically advocating for rich birds aren't i uh, <laughs> there is a lot ultimately we're all just people and we all have a perspective on climate change and adaptation and it doesn't you don't have to identify campaign groups i think in particular you could see them as part of a larger whole um but obviously some people have more freedom to do that than others. Yeah, I have less freedom to do that than others. <laughs> I guess, yeah, if we, if the research community focuses on creating outputs that are, are accessible, then these groups can just pick up on that and use it and run with it. Just a good shout out, Caitlin, but as with Katie, I think Mesfos is in bit of a challenging situation in terms of the way in which we are able to engage with groups like that. <laughs> I don't think our, our company would particularly want to, but one thing to pick up is that those groups mentioned there, are, I, I imagine and I think are mainly focused on mitigation issues. They want people to stop emitting carbon effectively. Um, they, in, in some ways, they might see resilience as a bit of a cop out because it's potentially deflecting the issue and people thinking oh we can just design our way out of this and we can keep polluting so i think that their interest is really fossil fuels and i I, you know, I support what they're doing in that sense i won't go any further but um i do think in wider perspective the next version of this if there's a future version of ukcr that it, it does would benefit a lot from engagement early on and up front to ask what what's needed from those who are making these important decisions, spending billions of pounds on Thames Tideway, for example, finding out what, what uh, all the major organisations in the UK need and haven't currently got, which may just be, we've got all the science, but we just need better information for how it's provided to us or better decision support tools or something. But let's, let's ask them and have that engagement. So one thing I wanted to ask you folks is uh, what um, Natalie and Louise presented yesterday, the, the National Framework for Climate Services. So how do you, I mean, you know, the, the program did uh, a lot of work and Natalie is still working on, on that. Uh, w what are your views on, on, I guess, the, um, the future 
of a potential national framework for climate services in the UK. It'd be interesting to to hear your views on that. So I guess Natalie, you 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 did you did that yesterday. So maybe you can start with with Katie and then go around the room. Straight to me. Okay, good. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, so uh, we were a respondent on the National Framework for Climate Services project um, and involved in uh, a lot of the work going on whilst that was scoped up. Um, and yeah, really supportive of, of the insights that went into that and, and came out of it, in fact. Um, from my perspective, what I'm doing with that work now is looking very, very carefully at what the future is around um, adaptation, research and innovation and how the particular, the sort of three strands that were identified within the National Framework for Climate Services could be taken forward into um, either the work that's being done through, I believe my character mentioned a couple of times, but the sort of, that, that sort of government level uh, scientific support for um, adaptation, research and innovation, um, and also potential future funding rounds for whatever might come next. So we're very much looking to keep that at the core of what goes next you know it's it they are they're very very usable and tangible things that we could be doing um but yeah it's it's a watch this space i guess in terms of, of, of where it goes next but you know we're working closely with the Met office and um, we'll be uh, continuing to take it forward in the next sort of months and years really mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure about yeah the future of the uh, framework, but I do think that the standard actually provides a really nice, the principles outlined in the standard are really nice way to sort of think about going about uh, considering user needs. So I think that there's sort of, there'll be longevity in that because it just provides a really nice sort of guidance for someone who is considering, um, yeah, wants to consider user needs in their service development. Um, first of all, I thought it was a great bit of work by Nicola, Natalie and Louise in the first instance. Um, obviously, additional funding or future funding would help. Um, but the flip side is, I think the workshop that you held a last week or two ago um, demonstrated that there is interest from the community in actually doing stuff anyway, albeit in the margins. So I think, I think it's up to us to a certain extent to make a bit of a, a start and help define it and demonstrate value. Um, and then if you get additional funding, it just helps accelerate matters. But I was really quite buoyed by the amount of time people said that we'd be able to commit and uh, the interest in sustaining a community. Thanks, Mark. I just wanted to add a sort of slightly uh, additional mess office perspective, if I if, if I may. Um, so, of course, the elephant in the room is, is is around funding, and there are various funding models. If something is a is a good idea and it's needed, there will be a way to to, to do that. So, I'm, I'm going to put the funding bit on one side for, for for a moment. I think, regardless of the funding, one thing that came out overwhelmingly from um, the stakeholders that took part is it's really useful to have um, additional open channels into government and into regulators as well. And I think that's something we, we absolutely need to capture in whatever form it takes. Um, I think the other is that it's helpful for the research domain, but we also need to see uh, initiatives like the standards and the national framework um, as focusing as much on implementation um, and pulling the research through acting possibly as a, or facilitating types of, of boundary organization which uh, are things that, that we've talked about amongst the, the champion team quite a lot um, and it's important to keep those those characteristics so those principles um, I think in mind when we view where the the national framework for climate services might go okay any final uh questions from the floor okay if not then uh can we please thank all our panelists please okay so we are now moving to the final segment can i invite kate and jason to join me here 
in the in the uh, I mean have a have a seat and, and I don't know Deborah whether you can put the slides um, back on. Let me see. Okay. Yes. So this is the yeah. This is the yeah. It's a bit. Uh, it's a bit uh, sad. It's sort of the final bit of the of the program. Uh, so um, yes, we. Oops. Let me see. I think we've, we've gone forward. Yeah. Um, so so I think yeah. It's just a, a few uh, remarks from from us in terms of yeah what what's been achieved over the last uh, four years and uh, and maybe what what could come afterwards. Uh, and also, and also thanks as well, actually. So, so maybe just in terms of this, this event and the last, I'm actually going to start with a thanks, if that's okay, uh, to, to in particular, you know, the champion team that, that's here that helped, uh, deliver this, this event. Uh, so particularly Deborah, who's over there. Uh, so thank you, Deborah. Um, but, but there's also, yeah, I'll, I'll mention all the names and then we clap. Uh, Julie at the back, Adam. Uh, Simon's here, um, Pete, uh, and uh, we have people in Leeds, uh, uh, Catherine, uh, Kate Locke, uh, Margot, and of course, Susie May Ma Graham, uh, that has been communicating with many of you. So, I mean, thanks to all of them to, to you know, to be able to cope with uh, changing dates. Uh, and so we've had to build a lot of resilience across the team. You might have noticed our, our events keep changing, uh, you know, even the Hull event as well. So, um, yeah, thanks. Thanks very much to all the champion team. It's, it's not just us. It's there's a team behind that that have helped us achieve this. And of course, you know, big thanks to UKRI and the Met Office. Many colleagues are here. So so thanks for the, the funding and the support over the last uh, four years. So I think we've we've achieved a lot. Um, yeah. Suraj is masterminded this whole event, so we need to have a special thanks to Suraj. <laughs> okay, thanks. Thanks, Kate. Uh, so, just just a few, you know, parting thoughts. I mean, um, I feel like, yeah, over the last four years, we we have one of the things, you know, we we have these legacy items. Rowan Sutton actually, you know, pushed us to to produce some legacy items in our, um, and hopefully, Rowan, you're watching in the live stream. Thank you for that. Um, you know, in our science plan, we came up with some 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 legacy items, and and one of them was very much around improving our climate change risk assessment capability and and i can you know and hopefully over the last you know day and a half you've now seen how much that's progressed you know from you know using climada to open claim to the climate risk indicators project but also some some of the physical processes around climate as well understanding that better as well as understanding you know socioeconomic uh, change as well so we now have you know, there's a lot of data, there's a lot of tools out there now available, and we're going to, you know, in the last few months, we're going to try to put, you know, as much as we can in the public domain so that people can use that. And and I think as someone was saying earlier in one of the panels, you know, there, there's still going to be papers coming out of this program in the next one to two years and, and even data as well. So so keep an eye out, even though, you know, we, we're kind of finishing in the next month, uh, the data, the papers uh, will, will will keep coming. Uh, and I feel, you know, we've we've achieved quite quite a lot of significant advancements. Uh, I think the other area, I mean, these are just a few areas we, you know, we can't be super comprehensive. So a few areas we're picking out in terms of key achievements. Another one was around, you know, using participatory approaches and novel art-based approaches as well to uh, engage the community in locally re relevant climate adaptation. You know, Hull was a, was a really big area of focus for quite a few projects. That's why we, we ran the showcase there. Uh, and, um, you know, there's been, you know, co-production of, of uh, adaptation strategies. You heard that from Liz yesterday and uh, in various other uh, activities as well. You can see some of them in, in those photos there. Um, we, again, you know, there's been a lot of, I mean, you know, as you can imagine, adaptation is all place-based. So place has been a really important focus of the program. And I feel, again, we've, we've made quite a lot of progress in terms of uh, you know, uh, climate services for the urban uh, cities, uh, development, you know, some of the embedded researchers, for example, develop adaptation plans. Uh, we have a performance, uh, you know, by the way, I'll tell you about a few things that are coming up after this, but, um, you know, Steve Scott Bottoms uh, created a performance entirely based uh, on, on local resilience in Leeds. Uh, and so place has been a really, again, another big area of, of development, I think, in the, in the program. And I think it will continue as well. 
Uh, and the final one is the one you've just been hearing about, you know, climate services. I guess, you know, there's now, a, 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 you know, as Murray said the other day, you know, there's now a standard. Uh, if, you know, you guys are in that space or even outside, you can pick it up and you could use that uh, for, you know, um, to, 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 to follow that, for example. And that potentially could lead into uh, adoption by, you know, BSI, ISO certification and so on. Uh, but also, we were just talking about the, the national climate, uh, national framework for climate services. So um, I think there's, um, yeah, there's there's quite a few interesting areas to kind of keep an eye out. Um, before I hand over to Kate to talk a bit about, you know, I guess some some ideas about the future, I did want to say a couple of things just to, as as a, as a reminder that, that there are still one or two events that are happening, and so I'd encourage you to to come to the Open Klim uh, Showcase. So that's on the 29th. I mean, just, just email us and the champion team so if, you, if you don't have the details. But besides the Open Klim Showcase, at, uh, as part of that event, so we're going to have Steve Scott Bottoms in London doing a performance of Who You're Going to Call. So uh, I'd encourage you to attend that. And then you've heard a lot about these insight papers. So it's not top secret. So we do... The, 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 the plan was to launch them here. So sadly, um, we, we just haven't got around to, to sorting out the contract with the publisher. But, you know, a lot of colleagues have worked really, really hard in developing these inside papers. And you're the first people to have seen it, either in the live stream or, or here. Uh, so you've had a peek of them. Uh, but our hope is that we will publish that as soon as possible. And so these are not academic papers. So th these are... Um, you know, 3,000 3, word, um, you know, uh, essays that are kind of synthesizing what we've learned, you know, in, in, in hazards, in, in the arts-based approaches and others. And the plan is to get that, you know, in the public domain as soon as possible. We're, we're certainly hoping in the next couple of months uh, that that should be feasible. Uh, so that's a little bit in terms of the direction of travel. And um, I think I'll hand over to, to Kate now. For the last one. Thank you, Suresh. Um, yeah, so I've got one slide just to talk about, um, yeah, the journey that we've been on, I guess, and what's next. So this is a representation, a visual representation of the programme. So we, between 2019 and 2023, we've had a lot of activity. Um, it's, been a, yeah, it's been a wonderful opportunity, but we've been building on, you know, previous activity. It's not, it's not the first time we've been doing work on um, climate adaptation. And there's you know, plenty of activity going on around that's not part of the programme. Um, but I guess the question is, how do we keep this going? Um, so we just had a, a put together a few thoughts. And I think what's nice is that we put together these thoughts before the, um, this event, but it's really nice to, to hear other people saying it. So it feels like we've, you know, we, it, it, we have got the right idea, I guess. So, so how do we keep this going? Um, so one of the, you know, we've heard a lot about how do we keep the community going? Um, of practitioners, research bodies and agencies, so not just researchers, you know, it's got to be a, a really mixed group. Um, and that, something about training of the next generation, so that could be lots of different things. It's, we had a bit about education, school education, but it could be around sort of having chartered and professional um, support. And what, what, also what, are there additional skills that adaptation researchers need? What are the competencies of an adaptation professional? So we think there's, there's, we're going to lead a lot of people to do this so how do we train those people so there's got to be some thought and effort into that um the next program if there is a next program uh, that we've had a lot from Svenja and other people today um you know it has to be now oriented it's got to be about the adaptation gap um and and starting with the decision starting with the the risk owner you know we've heard that just now so i think we all agree with that um focus on monitoring and evaluation in sort of indicators learning and sort of a continuous improvement um you know how do we do that how do we understand that um how do we have good indicators so there's there's a lot of work and we we heard from Dan this morning around that as well um and one one thing that we didn't really have in the program we talked you know we've had people talking about upscaling upscaling um but we you know, we, there is a thing called Innovate UK, you know, we could have worked with them, but how do we bring in those innovation and entrepreneurial skills? Um, you know, researchers could only go so far. Yeah, there's a whole set of other skills of professionals that would do this all the time. And how can we learn from them? How can we work with them to, so when we get 
you know, good ideas in, that we can up, I don't like the word upscale, but um, the, how, how can we develop them further um, and sort of encourage that the research insight actually can, can get into practice. Um, I think that was it. Thanks. I'd like to add a few reflections. I'd also like to add some uh, additional thank yous as well. So behind the scenes at the, at the Met Office, there have been a lot of people working who you won't have seen give the talks. Um, uh, Zaritzi Jones, for instance, has kept us on track. Um, Nick, Nick Hopkins Bond has been producing wonderful infographics. Um, and um, I think they've, they've really helped communicate um, the, the programme. There's lots of others behind the scenes as well. So I just want to thank all those behind the scenes uh, on the Met Office side, as well as um, on the, the UKRI side and colleagues there. Um, I was struck by the mention of legacy and I was just thinking through that, that, that legacy. So we have created um, some degree of cohesion to, to part of the community. And I think that is a really good step forward. It's, it's great to go to the webinars uh, and see the questions come in. Um, we're seeing it here on a, on a, on a bigger scale in a, in a way. Um, but the same names come back, um, plus additional names as well. And it's really nice seeing that develop through the, uh, the life of the, uh, the programme. As well as the, the community, we have actually generated a great deal of learning. Um, we've, we've generated new methods, we've generated new approaches. Um, we've generated, I think, in parts of the research community, um, a level of curiosity. Um, and I see that coming from physical science background. Now we're right at the start when we're planning. We actually think, what skills don't we have, as well as what skills do we have, and try to, try to find those. Um, one of the things I sort of try to do with that learning is, is to uh, help bring some of the, the training around um, uh, co-ex, co-production, co-development, et cetera, into the earlier stages of the, of the science. Um, and so we have that learning that goes across the entire program um, from the physical science all the way through uh, engagement, community responses, communication, um, and to some extent, decision making. Um, we also have data sets that we leave behind. So they're not going to be disappearing. Those um, data sets like eFlag we heard talked about yesterday um, and others like uh, the examples project, those data sets are available to use by other researchers um, in several of the communities. And I really hope that those, those data sets will be taken up. You can find them all on the, on the website and we will make sure they have a permanent home way beyond the, the, the length of the project. Um, we also, I think, have increasing evidence of where the output is being used. Um, so future drainage was mentioned. It's great to see that now actually appearing in guidance um, issued by EA and SEPA, for instance. Um, we've heard the urban projects talked about a great deal. It's great to actually see the urban work actually picked up and hearing where it is able to, to contribute something towards the um, the adaptation process, whatever stage it's at. So there's a, there's a lot of legacy in different stages, um, but there's also still a great deal to do. Um, I think some things that have particularly struck me is Mark um, picked up further on a, on a point about having a structure that it includes government, it includes um, academia, it includes the research councils, it includes the Met Office, it includes Environment Agency, it includes representation from the devolved administrations, it includes the private sector. And I think we really have seen where that benefits um, a programme of, of this type, especially where we want to pull through um, the results to implementation um, and do that on a, on a large scale. I think around co-production, one of the, the learnings from that is just how difficult it is. It's difficult, it's complex, it takes a lot of time, and it takes time from all of the people involved. And finding a way of creating a balance in those co-production exercises is incredibly difficult. I think we've, we've practiced some of those techniques, and I think we've, we've started to 
encourage more people to to learn about them. I think we've made loads of mistakes around co-production along the way as well. I, I certainly have, and I, I think I've seen seen lots of others. But I would hope overall we're sort of starting to get better uh, as a community. I think in terms of the gaps that um, remain, for me it's still helpful to to perhaps split them between um, big research gaps and implementation gaps. And we've heard in the different sessions um, uh, different views on what those research gaps are. Um, from the the, the the session that I moderated earlier, it was clear there were gaps around having a really clear uh, narrative of what an adapted UK looks like. Um, there were gaps around having high impact, low likelihood scenarios. There were gaps around cascading impacts. Um, but there were gaps in every single session. I think maybe we should try and put those onto a single a single slide after the, the meeting. I think that'd be quite useful for, for, for us to do as a champion team. Um, but there are also clearly gaps on the, on the implementation. Um, and we need to find a way of better linking um, the, the learning through to implementation on different scales. It needs to include government scale, but it also needs to include the regulator, local authorities, um, industry, uh, and organizations. It also in, includes local communities and individuals. And somehow we need to find a narrative that's internally consistent, but fit for purpose across those different groups. And I think that's probably a good place for, for, for me to stop. Thank you, everybody. Thanks. I mean, I don't think there's much more to say. I, whenever, whenever you say thanks, you always forget someone. And I've just realized, yes, I forgot the steering committee and the program board. I mean, they were very crucial in terms of, you know, steering us in, in, into where we came to here. And, and, and also to say it's been a pleasure to work with Kate and Jason over the last four years. So thank you very much. And uh, yes, I mean, the lunch is served upstairs. Please use this opportunity to do some more final networking. We've got that room for an hour or so. So um, thanks everyone for attending, both physically and, and uh, in the live stream as well. And um, yeah, we'll, we'll be in touch at least uh, over email uh, in the next, uh, until the end of the month at least, and a little bit beyond. But uh, thanks everyone. Bye.